Check. Thank you for your patience. We'll get started in just a minute. Mm. I just did I very sensitive microphone. Um, so we are welcome to our Board of Education uh, special action agenda meeting, work session. You're calling our meeting to order and please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Mrs. Sugars, can you please call the roll? Mrs. Scherfain? Here. Mrs. Gallagher? Here. Mr. Greenbaum? Here. Mr. Mayor? Dr. Rood? Here. Mrs. Qua Mrs. Niez? Here. Mrs. Tong? Here. Mrs. Winters? Here. Ms. Stern? Here. Thank you, Mrs. Sugars. And we are, our first order of business is our um, Shaka poster essay contest. So I turn it over to Dr. Morton. Thank you very much, Mrs. Stern. I'm very excited tonight to, to be joined by some special guests and we will be recognizing students for their participation in the Cherry Hill African American Civic Association's poster slash essay contest. I'm gonna call up Ms. Jenkins up to the microphone, who's gonna share information about the contest this year and award our recipients. Good afternoon or good evening. But this contest this year was Their Stories Matter, African Americans in our schools and community. And we had um, just some very quality entries. So what you'll see on our front row right here are the persons who were the subject of those projects. So there, um, I'll let you know as we go through them. So our first award goes to Avery McCongo from Bret Hart, and I'm gonna ask the subject of her award, Francesca Aldrich to stand. So wait, you're gonna do it like this. And then we're gonna take a picture. And then she's gonna read these words. Thank you. Okay. You want to shake hands? You want her to shake hands? And that was our kindergarten first grade first place. Now for the second and third grade, we had a three three way tie for first place. So our first first place winner isn't here, and that's Lindsay Langman. She is going to be in the Sound of Music, so she's at play rehearsal at West, so she couldn't be here. Our second first place winner is Amir Austin. Okay, good job. You know this one. Our third first place winner for second and third is Mason McDaniel. Okay, and we'll get your, your card to you. <laughs> Our second place winner for the second, third grade is Chloe Anderson. Here. 
Okay. Yeah. Our third place winner in the second and third grade is Baylor Black. Now, this. Now, just what what we have to tell you is that her, the person who um, she interviewed was her mother, Makai Hicks Black. She's disabled over there. <laughs> but Baylor did above and beyond because not only did she do a poster, she did a video as well. Okay, um, now we have our fourth, fifth grade, Chase Williams. Now, the objects, the subjects of these, his um, interview, and they can stand, is Linda King and Carlton Williams. He did his family members. And so. <laughs> All right, we have another Langman, and there, he, Andrew Langman was um, second place in the sixth, seventh grade, and he is not here. But first place in the sixth, seventh grade is Xavier Austin. Now, Xavier has been entering these contests since he was this high. So now he's taller than I am. <laughs> and we have Isabel Kushner. She's the third place winner. So for our eighth and ninth grade winner, we have Logan Walker from Carusi. I don't know if she's here, but the second place winner is Nimdi Tarant. The subject of her essay was me. <laughs> I'm her grandmother. <laughs> Okay, next we have Elias Kang. He's our third place winner. For our 10th and 11th grade, our first place winner is Sekou Tarant. And The subject of his, this is Dorothy Wood. She's a very good friend of mine. And he interviewed, what was the title? The Incredible, something, The Incredible Dorothy Wood or something like that. Yeah. But anyway. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, we have um, Talia J Dane. Did I miss somebody's subject? I did. Come on, Dahlia. We'll come back to that. <laughs> she interviewed um, one of her teachers, Tanitra Rogers from East, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Oh, I didn't, okay. All right, so we're gonna, um, Xavier, if you can come up again, and Alan Trotty, if you can come up too. I didn't know he was here. This is the subject of his um, essay. So, yes, we're gonna take a picture. A mirror, come back up. 
and the subject of hers is Victoria Carroll. Sherry Forbes. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Sherry Forbes. Yes. I'll, I'll get it right. <laughs> All right, getting back on track, <laughs> Sophia Bass. <laughs> and her subject was her grandmother who lives in New York? Yes. Okay. <laughs> And the last person is our senior, Kyle Layfield. How you say? It? How you say? It? Hey, Kyle is also the recipient of a a, a basket by C H E A, and it's to start you on your way to go to college. So there's some things in there, and I'll drop it off. Okay. Okay. okay thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations to all of the students. I hope that you all feel so proud of what you've accomplished. Okay, and we move on to presentations and it seems like we don't have any tonight and we also do not have any administrative reports dr morton okay so now we move on to correspondence do any board members have any correspondence they'd like to share i guess we'll just give it a second well everyone empties the room and then we'll start Okay, so let's move on to correspondence. Do any board members have correspondence? Mrs. Shafane. Yes, yeah, so I had the absolute honor of attending Cherry Hill West Junior ROTC's military ball on Friday evening. Um, it was a really fantastic event. Everybody was dressed to the nines. It, um, everybody had a great time. They even convinced my husband to partake in some of the traditions of the e evening as a reminiscent of his time in the military. So it was really nice. And I, I promised that I would give a shout out to the staff at Cherry Hill West for their sick dance moves on the dance floor. Um, but it was a really great evening. Thank you for letting us know. It sounds like appreciate your going there, especially after your very busy week. So thank you. Um, and other board members, uh, Mrs. Niaz. So I had the pleasure of going to the uh, Beauty and the Beast um, play at uh, Cruci Middle School. And then I also went to the um, Mean Girls play um, at Cherry Hill East. And I have to say, as someone who's not even a good bathroom singer, I was very impressed. Um, our students really put in hard work. They, they um, have been practicing for months. And it, I can say it really paid off. Um, and all the teachers and the staff uh, for working with them. I think it was it was a very good play. I enjoyed myself very much throughout the whole thing. And I really encourage everyone else um, to go to these plays because I think it's very important to uh, show support to our students. Um, there is, um, Wes is having um, the Sound of Music play next week. I encourage everybody to go. I'll definitely be going, so. Great. Other board members have correspondence. Mrs. Gallagher. <laughs> Uh, last Wednesday, I attended the Camping County Educational Commission board meeting. Um, and at the meeting, they presented the audit. Uh, there were no findings or recommendations. If anyone is interested in looking at the commission's audit, you can go to the website. It's camptonesc.org. If you click under public notices, 
and then there's a link that says board meetings and agendas. You can look at the agendas and all the attachments that go with the agenda. Um, and then just as another item that was discussed is, um, so this is located in Clementon. Um, they submitted for a grant to improve their recreational area in the township um, to, uh, I guess, add pickleball courts and uh, redo parking lots and basketball courts for the area. Um, it's for a, uh, a recreation improvement grant. So that was last Wednesday. I also attended um, Mean Girls over the weekend with my daughters. And um, thankfully, some of the jokes went over their head, but um, <laughs> but they had a great time. We all did. It was it was an absolutely fantastic um, performance. It was great. So I recommend. Well, there it's over now. So, but I recommend all the performances. They always do such an amazing job. Okay. And Mrs. Winters. So I am enjoying being part of the LMC, the Labor Management Collaborative. I stopped by as part of their overnight retreat, which was on Friday night. And then on Monday, I got to go to a full day LMC workshop, which was really neat. Um, there were districts there from all over the state. We had a good Cherry Hill contingency. There was a good amount of board members there. We took a board member track and we got to learn about how board members can be effective collaborators with the district. So it was a really productive day. And then I just wanted to point out, everybody got a copy of East Side. If you open it up, my favorite subject is featured. You all know what it is. It's the math pathways and there's a graphic. So my son apparently listens to what I say because I got a picture of this at seven o'clock in the morning, I guess, when he arrived at East and he saw this. And he's like, is this that thing you were talking about? It is. So if anybody wants to read more about our new math classes that are available at both high schools coming soon, you can read about it in Eastside. So thanks to Eastside for doing that really awesome feature on it. It was really nice to see. Great, thank you. Any other board members have correspondence? So um, I have a, just a couple. I also um, got a chance to stop by um, the Labor Management Collaborative um, evening. It was a very short stop in because I had forgotten that I had committed to plans that night on Friday night and I was gonna get in really big trouble if I yet missed another family activity for something board related. So <laughs> I chose not to get in trouble on the Friday night and instead I just stopped by for a short time. Uh, okay, I'm not really getting in trouble, I'm just, you know. It's a lot of, it's a lot of time. Um, and then I also got a chance to see Mean Girls and I concur um, with Ms. Niaz and Ms. Gallagher. Um, it was a really well done show, very impressive as you know, as you said, look, as they all are, um, just very fantastic, it was great. Um, and then um, I also got a chance to read as part of Read Across America at Stockton, which was my, my kids' own homeschool when they were in elementary. I read to the fifth graders, um, and I read a book called Aaron Slater Illustrator, which I have to remind myself by looking up the title. And I always great titles, but um, it was a really beautiful book about um, a student who struggles to learn, but is incredibly artistic and expressive, um, and was able to overcome um, his own uh, struggles and was recognized for his different way of success, of having success. Um, and this was in a class that was um, a class of students who were uh, what we would call an inclusion class. And I had, there were students who related to the struggle, who talked about their own experiences um, with, with trouble learning and how far they had come. One student was excited to share. It took him a long time to learn how to read but he got there and, you know, again, as I think all of these activities, whenever we go into the schools and we get to witness all of our students' successes and also some of their challenges, um, it's just always very humbling and a reminder to me to be in an event like that and hear directly from a younger student who has found success and confidence um, as a, a direct result of the fantastic learning experiences that he has in our district. So, um, you know, we are a district that is inclusive, that focuses on making sure all of our students um, have the best success they can and they all learn at their own pace. 
And um, it was really lovely that he felt safe enough in his classroom to share that. Um, and the book was was beautiful. It was a little a little more emotionally moved than I was expecting from Read Across America, but but that happens sometimes. So, um, and those were my correspondence. Any other board members? Okay. No, what was the book called? Um, Aaron Slater Illustrator, which I stumbled on reading the title because I Illustrator. I remember my kids learning about illustrators, and I thought, is it, am I missing the title somewhere? But that was the title. It was, and the artwork is beautiful. And the language is really poetic. It's beautiful, but it's relatable for fifth grade. So highly recommend you add it to your, <laughs> your list. It'd be great for your kids probably at their ages. Um, okay, so we now move on to first public comment. There will be two opportunities for public comment this evening. I'll open up my, my view of my window. Um, the first public comment session is for board action items only. There will be another public comment section for any topic related to our schools at the end of the meeting. If you are a student in the district, you may comment on any agenda item during first public comment period. If you are a student in the room and you wanted to comment, I would ask that you please approach the podium first if you would choose to do so. That way we make sure you go first. If you are online um, and you would like to speak and you are a student, please just put an S after your name so we know that you're a student and we can call on you first. Um, so if you would like to speak now, please identify the agenda item and clearly state your name and municipality. We will alternate between speakers here in the room and those who are online. Each speaker will be given a maximum of three minutes to speak. The timer on the screen will indicate the amount of time you have remaining. Public comment is an opportunity for members of the community to comment on matters relevant to the operations of Cherry Hill Public School District or within the authority of the Cherry Hill Board of Education. Under established federal law governing reasonable restrictions on speech and public forums, statements which demean individual community members or groups or which are irrelevant to the operations of the school district or are repetitive will not be permitted. Community members who would like to present information not relevant to the school district are always welcome to communicate directly to the district superintendent, board president, and all board members via email or other alternative means. Okay, so we will start in the room. If anyone would like to speak on any of our action uh, agenda items, please approach the podium. Anybody? Damn it. <laughs> I think you know the drill. It's been a, it's been a minute, but if you would say your I name and municipality, please. Okay. A lot of new faces. You know, I, my name is Martin Shirovsky, uh, 1108 Hartwood Drive in the Willowdale section of Cherry Hill. Uh, I was I worked in the district for 41 years, uh, and my last nine years, I was president of uh, Cherry Hill Education Association. <clears throat> Presently, I am vice president of the Camden County Retirees uh, association, and I'm also very much involved with the Cherry Hill Education Association Retirees, which is a philanthropic fund that we go and we we deal with and we have for the for the district and for students in need and you know anything else that's around and you know and available. Uh, I hope I'm at the right place at the right time. Okay, for nine years I served as the elected. Uh, president of the Cherry Hill Education I'm Association. Sorry, Mr. Shrofsky, could you just say the action item you plan to speak uh, on? Dr. Morton's uh, selection. Like, okay, so it's seven. Let me see. Nineteen point eight. Thank you. Sorry, I'm not going. Haven't memorized all the numbers. Nineteen point okay. eight. Uh, for nine years, I served as elected president of the Cherry Hill Education Association, representing the teachers, secretaries, and the custodial staff. I remember when Kwame Morton became principal of Kilmer School. During that time, I got to know him as a fair and knowledgeable principal and educator. Together, we dealt with numerous issues involving staff. He was approachable, and he listened to all sides of whatever situation needed his attention. He listened to any suggestions that I may have had, and he did so with a very, very, very open mind. <clears throat> Excuse me. While at Kilmer, Dr. Morton allowed the union to be flexible and creative in meeting the needs of the diverse population that is Kilmer School. 
when he was selected to serve as principal of High School West, he was welcomed by the community because his reputation of fairness preceded him. In my capacity as union president, I had many occasions to work with Dr. Morton and to address and solve issues that arose. His fairness was, again, evident, and he had the trust of the staff and the trust of the union. When, <clears throat> excuse me, when I saw the search committee was planning to recommend Dr. Morton as the new superintendent at Cherry Hill Schools, I was thrilled. I cannot overstate what a wonderful decision this recommendation is. The district will be getting a man of integrity, honesty, fairness, and knowledgeable of the workings of the Cherry Hill Public Schools. The students and staff of Cherry Hill will be getting the best person for the job. I strongly encourage the Board of Education to approve Dr. Kwame Morton, Dr. Kwame Morton as the next Thank superintendent Thank of schools. Thank you, Mr. Sharkey. Thank you so much. Okay, and then we go on to the line and the name on the line is um, uh, Jackie Caputo. If you could please state your full name and municipality. Good evening, my name is Jackie Caputo. I am a resident of Cherry Hill uh, in the Kingston section. I am currently the PTA president at High School West. I am here officially to speak on behalf of both high school PTAs, but before I do so, I would also like to say that personally, I have had the pleasure. I'm sorry, Ms. Caputo, could you please state the item you're speaking about? I'm sorry, I think you said it was 19.8, Dr. Morton's appointment as superintendent. Thank you, okay. Um, I'd like to say that I've had the opportunity to work with Dr. Morton as a parent, as a PTA president, as a co-committee member, and at all levels, he has shown himself to be fair and so caring of our children. He remembers the names of our children. I've seen him in the hallways speaking to kids. After they graduate, he still asks about my children who are now 27 and 24 years old. And I've always been incredibly impressed with his professionalism. Dr. Morton is not afraid to say, I don't know the answer, but I'll find out. And he does and gets back to you. I've also heard him say, my bad, we've messed up, let's fix it and try something else. I strongly personally recommend Dr. Morton for this position. And I will go on to say that the Cherry Hill High School East's PTA Executive Board congratulates and supports Dr. Morton as Superintendent of Cherry Hill Public Schools, and the Cherry Hill High School West PTA's Executive Board congratulates and supports Dr. Morton super, as Superintendent of Cherry Hill Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we go back to the room. Please state your name and your municipality. I think Hi, you may Board know of Education that's wrong. members and Dr. Morton. My name is Kristen Viglietta, Two Chateau Drive, Cherry Hill, in reference to item 19.8. Um, I'm the current um, chair of Zone PTA. Zone PTA works very closely with the superintendent, and we are grateful to the Board of Education for including focus groups specifically for Zone and Chiseptta in the early stages of the superintendent selection process. I wanna share a portion of an email update that I sent to the board recently regarding updates from Zone. And I quote, we have found our relationship with acting superintendent, Dr. Morton to be extremely productive. Dr. Morton values open-minded thinking, is a cooperative partner with us, and we have accomplished more in these past few months than during any time in recent memory. With Dr. Morton's leadership, collaboration and support, here are some of the issues and initiatives that Zone has successfully undertaken. Zone PTA has made it a focus this year to partner with the district on several techno technology concerns, the first being cell phone usage at the secondary level. Zone Exec Board brought this to Dr. Morton, who immediately lent his support and facilitated the first meeting between the Zone Technology Committee and the district. Number two, a huge help to all of the parent volunteers at the elementary level is that they are now allowed to have three parent volunteers for classroom parties instead of two. It happened in one quick conversation with Dr. Morton. Because of Dr. Morton's support, Zone PTA now has a partnership with ESS so that Zone can help fill the substitute pipeline in Cherry Hill. Number four, we were made aware that both high school bathrooms were locked during part of the academic day, leaving no bathrooms open to students. We worked with Dr. Morton to get bathrooms open throughout the day at each school. 
This is an enormous improvement for the mental well being of our high school students. Number five, Carusi is currently the only middle school with a junior national honor society. We brought the idea of implementing this at all three middle schools to Dr. Morton. Dr. Morton worked with the middle level principals and it appears that junior national honor society will be at all three middle schools next year. Number six, it was brought to Zone's attention that the homework expectations at each of the three middle schools vary widely, which we brought to Dr. Morton. We are currently working on establishing more uniform expectations across the three schools. Number seven, we worked with Dr. Morton to ensure that no homework is given on Thursday nights when dances are held at the middle level for Carusi and Rosa. The Zone Exec Board remains so grateful for the relationship we have with the district, with Dr. Morton, and also the relationship with the Board of Education, end quote. Zone's executive board has voted, and we congratulate and support Dr. Morton in his new role as superintendent of schools. Thank you. Okay, and we go back to the line, and it's Christy Badrin. If you could please state your name and municipality. There we go. Hi, Christy Badron, 315 Surrey Road, and I am speaking on behalf of 19.8, um, Dr. Mortens. Uh, as a principal over at Kilmer, we would like to uh, show our support and explain and just what a wonderful person he's been at our school and how he's helped out. I was not fortunate enough to have him as our principal, um, but I have heard amazing things. We, he also has the backing of our wonderful staff members as well. Um, so on behalf of the elementary school PTA executive boards, I would like to share the following. Clara Barton's PTA executive board congratulates and supports Dr. Morton as superintendent. JF Cooper's PTA executive board congratulates and supports Dr. Morton as superintendent. Brett Hart's PTA Executive Board congratulates and supports Dr. Morton as Superintendent. James Johnson PTA Executive Board congrats, congratulates and supports Dr. Morton as Superintendent. Kingston's PTA Executive Board congratulates and supports Dr. Morton as Superintendent. A. Russell Knight's PTA Executive Board congratulates and supports Dr. Morton as Superintendent. Horace Mann's PTA Executive Board congratulates and supports Dr. Morton as Superintendent. Thomas Payne's PTA Executive Board congratulates and supports Dr. Morton as Superintendent. Joseph D. Sharp's PTA Executive Board congratulates and supports Dr. Morton as Superintendent of Cherry Hill Schools. Rich Richard Stockton's PTA Executive Board congratulates and supports Dr. Morton as Superintendent of Cherry Hill Public Schools. Woodcrest PTA Executive Board congratulates and supports Dr. Morton as Superintendent of Cherry Hill Public Schools. And finally, finally and resoundingly, the Joyce Kilmer PTA Executive Board congratulates and supports Dr. Morton as Superintendent of Cherry Hill Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you. That's a lot of schools. <laughs> it was. I'm impressed <laughs> and you I could say all 20, that. And I did it under, under three minutes. <laughs> Yes, you did. Well done, Christy. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> okay. If you could okay. please state your name and municipality the item you're speaking on today. Hello, my name is Susan Dermer, and I'm a resident of Cherry Hill. I'm commenting on agenda item 19.8. On behalf of the middle school PTA executive boards, I'd like to share the following. Henry, Henry C. Beck's PTA executive board con congratulates and supports Dr. Morin as superintendent of Cherry Hill Public Schools. John A. Carusi's PTA Executive Board congratulates and supports Dr. Morton as Superintendent of the Cherry Hill Public Schools. And Rosa International PTA Executive Board congratulates and supports Dr. Morton as Superintendent of the Cherry Hill Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you. Shorter list, but nonetheless, <laughs> inclusive list. Okay, and we go back to the line and we have uh, Bridget Palmer. If you could put your, uh, please state your full name and municipality. Hi, my name is Bridget Palmer, 37 Chestnut Terrace, and I live in Cherry Hill. Um, I'm here tonight to speak on agenda item 19.8, uh, Dr. Morton's appointment as superintendent. Um, my husband and I have made our home here in Cherry Hill for the last 10 years, and I've worked in the community for um, many more years than that. 
And, you know, like so many other families our age, the reason we chose Cherry Hill um, was partly because of the school district. We have two kids who are in middle school. They're sixth graders at Carusi. Um, and when I, I saw that the superintendent position was being vacated, um, I had a lot of concerns about who would be next and what it would mean for, for families like mine who had kids in the middle of their careers uh, in the Cherry Hill schools. But when I saw that, that Dr. Morton was up for consideration, um, I thought, you know what, this is, this is the guy and this, this is who I want to serve as my superintendent while my kids are here. Um, I've had the pleasure of watching him grow his, his career as, as an educator, as an administrator, um, and I'm and, and confident that our schools will be in the best possible hands with him. Um, he is understanding, he is fair, he is um, more than qualified. Um, and I have to say, I, my daughter is not someone who is easily impressed, but she commented on how visible he's been. And she was actually on a, a panel of students that met with him a few weeks ago at Carusi. And when she came home to him, when she came home to me at the end of the day, she said, mom, I really felt heard. I really feel like he understands. I really feel like he wanted to hear what we had to say. And, you know, to me that that's it in a nutshell, right? He's somebody who wants to be involved, who cares what, what matters to our students, who cares what matters to our families um, and is, is going to make decisions that are in the best interest of the district and our kids, um, whether it's always the popular decision or not. And, and that's the sign of a leader. Um, so I will be proud to live in a district and educate my kids in a district that Dr. Morton leads. Um, you know, I applaud the board for, um, I hope, affirming his appointment and, uh, and just, you know, want to say on, on behalf of my one family, you know, Dr. Morton, congratulations and, and thank you for your service. Okay, let me go back to the room. If you can. Pat you know McCargo, <laughs> 991 Kingston Drive. I'm not a PTA member. I'm a parent, not even a parent of kids in their school anymore. Mrs. McCargo, will you say the item oh, you're sorry, speaking the on? I'm superintendency. 19.8, Mrs. 19 McCargo? 19.8, yes. <laughs> yes, that's correct. And, you know, my husband served on this board and we raised our children and our children came to this school district, as did I. Back when I came to the district, I was one of three African-Americans in a class of 600. So I applaud the board for making this step forward because it shows our community and your community as well that everybody can come up and move forward in the district. And, and Dr. Morton has every tool in his arsenal that will enable him to be an excellent, an excellent superintendent. And I urge this board to do the right thing. You, you were searching for a year, but you came back to Dr. Morton because you knew Dr. Morton would do an excellent job. And I applaud the board and ask you to please pass this and do whatever you have to do to make him our superintendent. Thank you. Okay. And now we go to the line and it's Dawn Marie Higgins. If you could please state your name, your municipality and the item you're speaking on tonight. Dawn Higgins, 207 Rhode Island Avenue in Cherry Hill. And I'm commenting on item 19.8. I've lived in Cherry Hill for more than 50 years. My husband and I are proud West graduates and all five of our kids went there. I'm also a longtime board member of the Lions Pride Alumni Association. Cherry Hill schools matter to me. I am here in support of Dr. Morton. His tenure with the Cherry Hill school system has been long and distinguished. His work ethic is obvious and we have benefited from it. I believe him to be a man of character and integrity, and he has earned this position. He knows us and we know him, which can only work to our mutual benefit. I congratulate and support Dr. Kwame Morton as our new superintendent. Thank you. Okay, we go back to the room. You know the drill too. <laughs> uh, Jen Nadio, Cherry Hill. Um, I am so, here. Miss, I just give a second while we restart the clock. Oh I'm yeah, sorry. do that. Yeah, that's good. Sorry, I want to make sure you get through. Okay, go ahead, I don't have a lot, but that's good. Okay, Jen Nadio, um, Cherry Hill. I am speaking on 19.8. And just to make it clear, I am here to speak on behalf of the Chisepta Executive Board. And I am the president of Chisepta. 
as an acting superintendent, Dr. Morton initiated meeting with Giuseppe monthly. We have been meeting with him um, and creating more objectives and ideas to assist our students in special education. He is listening to what we say and he works with us to make changes. After meeting and discussing this announcement, the Giuseppe Executive Board congratulates and supports Dr. Morton as superintendent of Cherry Hill Public Schools. Thank you for listening to our families. Okay, and we go back to the line and it's Maya Fleck. If you could please state your name, your municipality and the item you're speaking on. Um, hi, my name is uh, Justin Geck. I'm a former Cherry Hill resident and Cherry Hill Public Schools alumnus. I'm speaking in reference to agenda item 19.8. Um, I'm speaking tonight to lend my support for having Dr. Kwame Morton chosen as superintendent for the Cherry Hill School District. I've known Dr. Morton for 16 years since he started in the district as a principal of Joyce Kilmer Elementary School. I was in fifth grade at the time and can still remember what he was like. From day one, he was always visible and in tune with students and his staff. I can remember him being at the school functions, including Volley for Support, concerts, and family nights. As I continued on to middle school at Rosa and then finally High School West, I still kept in touch with Dr. Morton, continuing to keep him updated on my latest adventures. Although busy, he would always find time to get back. I would also still see him around at different school functions. Dr. Joe Malash was the principal at High School West when I was a freshman, but at the end of that year, he was moving over to administration. A search for a new principal was underway and was finally chosen. That person, Dr. Morton. I was thrilled to hear this news and knew he would be perfect for this role. As soon as, I, as he began, I could see the positive changes he was making around the school. Again, I go back to the word visible. Dr. Morton was always out in the hallways with the radio, greeting students and staff in between classes and during the lunch periods. He got to know students and always made an effort to ask how family was or an event someone that had told him about. He would treat us like his own kids, which as all of you know, he has many of his own. You would think he would not remember every conversation or family with his own personal life. But for me personally, he would always ask about my mom or my grandmother. I was also the editor in chief of the High School West newspaper and had many interviews with Dr. Morton discussing his vision for each school year and different issues facing the school. He was always forthcoming and with his information and took the time to explain his decisions. I graduated from West in 2016 and can even remember Dr. Morton's commencement speech to my class. He called out several students, myself included, who he had been with and got to know since he started in the district. I couldn't believe he remembered all the things about everyone. Um, you know, during, during those years, um, I saw Dr. Morton go from principal to district administration and continue to show his leadership and problem solving skills. I know our district has faced and continues to face many challenges and obstacles. And I know Dr. Morton would be the perfect person to be in this position at the Helms to guide us through whatever situations that may be. Dr. Morton has earned this privilege and has had more than proven himself. He has risen through the ranks and has excelled at every position he's been in. Dr. Kwame Morton is a man of intelligence, leadership, problem solving, compassion, strength, and vision. Dr. Morton, I just wanna thank you for continuing to be a mentor and most importantly, a friend. Um, it's my hope that the board will vote yes to confirm Dr. Morton tonight as the new superintendent of the school district. Thank you. Okay, we go back to the room. You can please say Thank you. <laughs> your name. I'm excited. This microphone is my height. Um, my name is Tina Truitt O'Neill, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Cherry Hill African American Civic Association for 19.8, um, the appointment of Dr. Morton. Uh, Cherry Hill African American Civic Association did send a letter to the board on January 19th, and I will read some of the letter. Cherry Hill African American Civic Association is very excited about Dr. Morton's appointment, Dr. Morton's performance as acting superintendent verifies why he was selected as the visionary principal of the year for the school year 2021 to 2022. He seamlessly assumed the position of acting superintendent after Dr. Joseph Maloche retired last year. Dr. Morton has superbly supervised our school's 800 plus teachers and met the educational needs of our 10,000 plus students. 
As the acting superintendent, Dr. Morton has taken significant action to make sure that our students feel safe and supported in our school. While a principal at Cherry Hill West, he adopted a policy labeled No Child is Invisible. This policy focused on ensuring that students at West felt or um, has enabled him to effectively tackle problems, sorry, <laughs> that their school they felt as a safe haven. Most recently, his experience in providing our students with a safe haven or anti-Muslim remarks and behaviors in our schools. Since the start of the Israel-Palestinian war, our schools, like many schools around the country, are experiencing an increase in hate speech and hate-related actions. In response to the problems, Dr. Morton adopted and encouraged use of the policy that our schools are no place for hate. During school board meetings, he was voiced and empathized with the district's reminder that all students must be treated equally. Finally, we note that Dr. Morton, who was educated of the year in 2011, has shown that his commitment to doing great and hard work for our school system, he has been no less than brilliant and hardworking from the time he was hired as a principal at Joyce Kilmer to his work as principal at Cherry Hill West to his work as an assistant a superintendent and now as acting superintendent. So on behalf of the Cherry Hill African American Civic Association, uh, Danny Elmore Esquire, who is our vice president, we are excited and we applaud the board to appoint Dr. Morton as our next superintendent. And on a personal note, I would just like to say that I have three children, two have graduated from Cherry Hill West, one will be graduating in a few months, and I also have grandchildren in the district, and I am elated that you will be filling the superintendent role. Thank you so much. Okay, we go back to the line, and it's a phone number ending in 788. Please state your name, your municipality, and the item you're speaking on. Hello, my name is Jeff Hardowitz, and I live in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and I'm talking about, wait, 17.2. 17.2, hello? Um, anyway, um, that's about the preschool um, resolution improving early childhood preschool budget, 2024-2025. Um, right now I'm looking at something called the total spending detail for the year's 2021 to 2022. Um, all right, that was uh, three, four years ago. And for Cherry Hill, the total spending detail, that's without, without, um, without, debt, without debt service, because that was before the bond, was $24,972 per student. Let me repeat that number, $24,972 dollars per student. Now that was two or three years ago. Um, uh, given 540 kids, um, and given that actually in preschool you need one teacher and one and, and one and one assistant and one assistant and they're they're you know we're talking about also building and construction and all those other things. I question that um, Seven million six hundred dollars would do the job for seven hundred and forty students. I don't know what's going on. There are different ways to calculate what costs are, but if you look at the total spending costs, and it's twenty four thousand nine hundred seventy two dollars, um, literally, literally two years ago or three years ago, um, I would I would think that that's the real cost per pupil probably higher. I see the numbers you're presenting, but uh, like I said, there are different ways to calculate what total costs are. I guess um, that's my question, and I would hope that board members would kind of ask. I'm going to discuss this a little bit more in public comment, too. I just saw that, but it's um, um, about state aid and 
what's going on, but that's beside the point. Anyway, thank you for listening, and you all can look at it with your phones right now if you want to. Total spending detail. Uh, you could find it, you know, you, you have to go to the DOE's website and you could find that. Um, it's, thank you very much. That's it. Bye. Okay? So far, there's been three OCR complaints that have been won. One of them was under Beck, which cost taxpayers over $800,000. So right now, after the two other OCR complaints that are, that, that are filed, we could be at over a million dollars because Dr. Morton is not listening. Quote from you from a December 6, 2021 uh, letter sent by the district. Statton reported about the complaint. December 3rd, 2021, an actual event came in. Dr. Morton has done everything to hide this from the public. Cutting me off two or three times this week. So how did this affect the community? Well, in an email to me, he wrote, "It should be a Black Lives Matter." Yes. Truth about Black Lives Matter. Truth about Black Lives Matter is that in Cherry Hill, they have cost seventy thousand dollars in overtime. Black Lives Matter has demonized police. Across the United States. So, we don't keep Black Lives Matter truth. Black Black Lives Matter. This is where the spirit is. So, Hello. I can't hear you. Uh, Andy McElvain, Cherry Hill. Um, I just want to commend the board for selecting Dr. Kwame Morton as a 45 year resident of Cherry Hill, a 19 year uh, parent at Cherry Hill schools for three children. Uh, my youngest graduated 21 years ago. I've been involved in the school district off and on for the last 30 plus years. I sat at board tables in this district and another district for a total of 14 years. I cannot think of a better individual for the uh, Cherry Hill School District uh, as superintendent than Dr. Kwame Morton. Congratulations.
Okay, we're still in the room, a very familiar face. We haven't seen it in a few months. Do, do the drill, okay? Municipality, and I didn't do much for sure. Corinne Elmer Schmatton, Cherry Home, Jersey, Stephen Bond, 1928. Dr. Martin. Um, so, first, I um, just want to say kudos to the uh, board for making this monumental. Um, not just the African American community, but for our community at large. I will say that Cherry Hill has come from light years beyond where it was, where at one point you could refer to our town uh, specifically being divided as once being Match Town versus East Side versus West Side. And that Match Town referred to where the majority of African Americans live. And so I know I heard this part of refer to the fact that there was a time when there was only three African Americans in the entire school that Cherry Hill was. And so going from that and then only having African American males that were just serving maybe even as custodians or groundsmen to now having African Americans that are teaching in classrooms, that are leading schools, and that were once sitting over there as assistant superintendents and now being the first African American male to run our district is just light years past where we have ever thought we could be. And so I'm super proud, especially being a mom of four black sons. So this is a great day for me. Um, and besides that, I want to also give kudos to the other African American and other women that sat and waited to break barriers and opened the doors for him to be considered that seat. So Dr. Mayhem, Dr. Weddington, and the other lady that are sitting over there, Ms. Mallory. Everyone that broke that barrier ensured that he can have an opportunity, and I thank you all for making sure that that impact was made. Other things I want to point out just to certify and verify and let you know that you made the right choice. He is the only person that we've had that have come through our doors that is certified as a tournament principal. And what does that mean? Everything that you want for achieving the act to fix the disparities we have in our scores across the board, he's certified to do that. And I hope that he teaches others how to do that around my district. And speaking to goals, which someone uh, previously mentioned, I actually really prefer to refer to the goals that he's actually set up for us, specifically the ones where he would like for every student to be reading at grade level or above by the end of third grade. That was something that he decided that he wanted to take one challenge to do. And guess what we're going to do? And I say we as a community and as a member of Cherry Hill African American Civic Association, we're going to hold his feet to the fire and make that happen, just like we held every other person sitting in that seat to the fire as well. So I hope you join us in that. I absolutely encourage you to say yes. And for those that say no, I hope he shows and proves that you absolutely should have said yes. Okay, and we have nobody else on the line, so we're still in the room. Yep, yep, nobody else on the line. You said your full name, your municipality, and why you're speaking on. Sure. Can you tell me? I'm Amber Churchill, and I'm on the line 19.8. You can speak into the microphone, thank you. I'm here, so I'm here to comment on 19.8. Um, the feedback from students, teachers, parents, staff, and community members has provided a strong framework for the ideal qualities 
of the next superintendent of Cherry Hill Public Schools. We ask for our next superintendent to be engaged, collaborative, transparent, someone who encourages and values student voice, someone who supports the needs of all students, someone who prioritizes student achievement, equity, inclusion, and belonging, someone that exhibits great integrity and a high level of emotional intelligence. We want them to be respectful and to have strong core values. Someone who places the student at the center of every decision and who fosters an open and safe environment creating a sense of community. Dr. Morgan embodies all of these qualities. I have had the privilege of sitting in a small group setting and small group meeting with him, attending events where he spoke or was simply present, and most recently walked the halls of a child's elementary school with him. After every interaction, I left feeling hopeful, inspired, and excited for the future of our district. After every interaction with him, I told myself, this man needs to be our next superintendent. There can be no other choice. So having said that, I would like to express my unwavering support for his leadership. Thank you. Okay. Also, how are we going to do? Please state your full name. Well, there's nobody. I'm sorry. There's nobody else on the line. Okay. Thank you for just, checking. No problem. Uh, well, and yeah. You, you know Eileen Duran uh, from Cherry Hill, also speaking on 19.8. Um, I may need a guard to walk me to my car. <laughs> um, but I think that if we don't um, talk about the concerns on the other side, that you know, we can't we can't fix them. So. Um, I am disappointed in the decision to recommend Dr. Morton for the position of superintendent. It's not personal, um, it's, but, but it's about some concerns I have for the district and whether he's the right person at this time for that. Our district ha does have longstanding issues with ADA compliance, HIV, teacher morale, school violence, disparity in performance between schools, particularly high school, um, special education and the relationship with those families. And I feel we're dis discarding an opportunity here. I, I feel like we need someone with a great deal of experience as a full superintendent already coming into it, um, and someone with a proven experience solving some of these ongoing challenges I just named. Um, I kind of feel like we need fresh eyes and ideas to take on these problems. Um, it's hard to see things when you've been a part of the problem. You know, you've been here while the problem's occurring. Um, we have many good programs and successes that you know candidates could um, that most candidates could continue, but I feel like we need new insight and new approaches to see and tackle the longstanding challenges. Like I said, if we don't if we can see the problems and we don't name them, we can't address them. Um, many of us have waited eight, ten years for an opportunity for new leadership um, and a chance for real change for these important issues, and this chance will likely not come again for another five or ten years. It's, it disappoints me personally to see us pass this opportunity by. I recognize I've been around long enough. I know this is already a done deal. Um, so that said, like I said, I, I wanted to name the concerns because then we, can, then we can do something about them. And all that said, Dr. Moran, I, I do wish you well. And I challenge you, prove me wrong. I want to come up to the microphone and say, you know what, that, that night I was wrong. But um, I ask you to please commit yeah, if you are selected to, um, you know, to close that performance gap, increase teacher morale. Our teachers are hurting. They reach out to me all the time. They do not feel heard. Um, address the ongoing concerns with ADA compliance. That's been decades. Um, you know, bridge that gap with our families in special education who don't feel heard and their children's needs aren't being met and take a look at the school violence. Uh, I don't want to keep seeing those videos we've been seeing. It was terrible, um, and HIV, which is related. So um, I thank you for letting me share the other side. And again, I wish you well. Okay, there's no other hands on, on the line. If there are any, but if there's anybody else in the room, I don't see anybody else in the room. I do see somebody in the room approaching the podium. A lot of familiar faces. If you could please Sorry. state your name, your municipality. Sure. Municipal Jim Neary, Cherry name. Hill. Uh, I was gonna speak on 19.8 and also a question on 17.2. So as far as 19.8 goes, congratulations, Dr. Morton. I know I said it to the other day. Um, 
the fact that the Board of Education probably has not had an email from me in several months is probably the only endorsement that I really need to say. I, I haven't sent you guys one of my famous emails that Mr. Green probably has to review to make sure the codes that I'm citing is accurate or, or whatnot. And, and I will say that that is because I've had concerns over the past few months. I've had some very, very deep concerns. I had a major concern within the past few months that I had a year before that. And when that concern was presented, I had a call back within a day from Dr. Morton. We had a phone call. He brought in another administrator to sit on that call. When I pointed out something that I had pointed out a year ago and was not addressed, it was addressed. Dr. Morton said, you know what? You're right. And he fixed the issue as far as I can tell because the same thing that I was concerned about has happened three more times in a classroom since the original incident that I called him about, but it was handled in a completely different way going forward after I spoke to Dr. Morton. So those are the things that I am here to say. I appreciate Dr. Morton. I appreciate you listening to me. Um, my other concern was 17.2, it was the preschool budget. I don't wanna be a, a Debbie Downer on preschool. I am a former preschool teacher. I am just concerned seeing that it looks like we are putting up $7 million something dollars for preschool and we were just stripped of seven something million dollars. Please think about it very carefully. I know you guys have spent a lot of time planning, but I don't want to see our current students affected because we're trying to be game changers and ahead of the game with a preschool wagon. If we can't support the students we have, we need to think about that before we push on new programs for the students that we're going to be getting. Thank you. Okay. And we have nobody on the line, so and we'll keep going in the room. <laughs> uh, you're on Yaris Cherry Hill. I'm um, talking about 16.9 and also just to change things up, also want to add in 17.3 um, that I think addresses some of the concerns that were up. The LMC, the fact that our past union president, current union president have all spoken, is a game changer. Um, there's not much more that can be said in this grant that will allow us to do even more and more money coming from the state for us to address those challenges. As a teacher myself now, I, those challenges are real, but I can tell you that every moment Dr. Morton knows those and recognizes it. He has not forgotten his roots as a math teacher uh, since as many days as being an administrator. He takes that approach as someone who still understands the classroom setting and what teachers do. Not every administrator can do that. As they get further and further away, they forget about what the classroom experience is. That is not the case with him. Um, I reached out and emailed this to you um, right after we got the horrible news and the budget cuts, but I think it's really important um, to raise that we have this with Dr. Morton. We can ask that our superintendent be a person who truly listens to the constituents and takes all kinds of feedback, even the worst kind of feedback where you've got major challenges and does uses that to make the best decision through their process. We can also ask for not to say, uh, to say, I don't know and I need to learn more. That vulnerability is really important. We're education. We're teaching our students every day that we don't know everything and that we're learning. We are lifelong learners in Cherry Hill. We have talked about this in this room countless times. That is what Dr. Morton preaches. Uh, we can ask our superintendent to care and be passionate about our district. I cannot meet somebody more passionate than Dr. Morton about Cherry Hill without somebody else living here, that he loves this district. He knows it inside and out. He speaks to it and it is incredible. As someone who is a lifer in this community, I have never seen someone with this level of passion and this level of foresight for all 19 schools. And finally, we must ask our superintendent to be an advocate and someone willing to do all within their power to make education the best. That's what he does. That's what he did at West. That's what he did at Kilmer. As a parent now at Kilmer, I can't tell you how many staff members are there that he hired. And you know a mark of a Dr. Morton hire because it is a caliber that he is at. He knows how to find talent, attract talent, maintain talent and everything about that. And on a personal note, as a father of six to a father of 10, it's incredible for me to have somebody to look up to like that, who still has children going through the education because it keeps you grounded in reality because every question you make and you take yourself is what would this do for my kid? And what would you do if I was a parent sitting there and Dr. Morton brings it all together. I am so excited for my kids to be here. I hope we are still here when the last one graduates in 2040. <laughs> Your wife might not like that one for me, <laughs> but I'm really excited for my kids to be able to go through and see your vision. I thank the board for doing it. It's not always easy. You go in thinking we're gonna have a national search, but it turns out we've got a national candidate right here. 
that it was just homegrown talent, and Cherry Hill has been the best place to find homegrown talent. Thank you. Okay. Looks like we have nobody on the line, so we are still in the room. Ann Einhorn, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. So it's my tradition to give each new superintendent a big bottle of extra strength Tylenol. Mrs. Mrs. Einhorn. Oh, 19.8. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm so well trained. But anyway, um, so I usually give them a, the extra large bottle of extra strength Tylenol. But I, I did want to do that in a public forum because I didn't want anyone to think I was currying favor with you. But I wish you well in the days to succeed. Um, my favorite story about Dr. Morton is the fact that he took Cherry Hill West, he turned it around. But the number one thing, it's because of my music educator son that he did was instill pride in the Cherry Hill marching band and finally getting them uniforms. So that they could be an integral part of the community, perform um, to their expectations. And thank God you did that before Jim Mark retired. So from the bottom of my heart, I will always be grateful for that and instilling that sense of pride in a school that desperately needed it. Um, it's really easy to stand here and blame everything on the superintendent, but having sat on the other side of this microphone, I can tell you it's up to the Board of Education that sits before us to make sure that the schools are run well. It's a partnership, okay? So we can be mad at certain things and I've certainly had my own issues with the district um, on certain things, but it's a partnership. And I'm hoping that now that we have a full-time acting, full-time superintendent, that we can start to move forward. I hope we will have a board that stays in place for their current terms, because that's also been an issue um, the last couple of years, in my humble opinion. All I can say every day is a journey. People ask me, how am I? And I say, well, I got up today. And at my lofty age, it's a blessing, okay? Everybody struggles with many, many things in their personal life. You're all human beings. I'm a human being and the people in the audience. People have issues. They have children. You know, as parents, we only want the best for our children. And sometimes the passion comes through in such a negative way that the education of our children in Cherry Hill gets lost in that conversation. So I hope that every day is a great day for you. Um, every day is going to be a challenge, and you already know this from the last few months. All right, um, I, I want you to know I brought out my brand new kids for you. I won't dance because it would be a sham, okay? But I wish you nothing but the best and our community nothing but the best. Thank you. Okay, still no more hands on the line. It doesn't look like there's any but the microphone. I'm gonna close public comment one. Okay. And now we move on to our board work session. Um, Mrs. Winters, could you please start us off with giving the curriculum and instruction report? I would be happy to. So the CNI committee met on March 4th. We began in closed session discussing SAC program, but then we came into open session and we had two major things on the agenda. The first was the summer reading books. Um, we talked about the summer reading theme for the high schoolers is mystery and thriller, which I'm very excited about. And the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade books, there was one additional book, I believe, for middle school that was added as well. If anybody's interested, the full presentation is on the website. If you click on Board of Education under Board Presentations, that presentation is there. If anybody is excited to read some of the reading books, some reading books ahead of time, I'm thrilled to say that I asked other board members who are not on CNI to do some reading with us. So we're all going to have some book reports for you probably next month about the summer reading choices. The other thing was that we received a full presentation from the middle level principals on schedule revisions at the middle level. There are just a couple of things I want to highlight. And like I said, the full presentation is available under board presentations if you would like to review it online. Um, the first major change is that we're gonna add some time back to the advisory period. And the reason why this is really important, one reason why it's important is that advisory is when music happens in middle school. So our band, orchestra, and chorus kids meet during advisory. When the current schedule was implemented, advisory shrunk, and so there wasn't as much time in the day for music, which is something that, as you know, I'm a big supporter of. So I'm thrilled that the music students will get more time for that. The other major change is that there's gonna be added a period, Dr. Morton, help me, I wanna say it's INE, is that correct? 
Yes, that's correct. Thank you. I was thinking, but that's elementary school, but it's true now too. So there'll be an I and E period added at the middle level for the middle school students for them to receive both help and enrichment. Um, and that will be a period that happens during the day. It'll be the other half of their lunch block. So they'll have lunch for 26 minutes and then an I and E period. Every single student in the school will get that. So if you would like to see the full revisions to the middle level schedule, again, that presentation is online and the hope and expectation is that will be implemented for September. As a parent of a current middle school student, I am very excited about the schedule changes. I think it'll be a net positive for our middle level kids. And then in new business, we discussed cell phone usage in school. So I'm going to kind of jump forwards and backwards in time. I actually had the honor of chairing PNL right before CNI, and we had that conversation there as well. So both committees simultaneously were talking about cell phone usage. And the way that the committees decided to move forward was that we were going to ask the, ask the teachers first what they're seeing with cell phone usage in schools and how it affects the classroom experience and especially during instructional time. So that was the first step that the committees decided was important is to ask our teachers what they see on the ground. After that, we're gonna move forward to have discussions with more far ranging discussions with students and the larger parents and community. I know Dr. Morton has started discussions with our students through the interactions he has with them at the middle and high school level and gotten their impressions of how they feel cell phone use impacts their educational day. And he shared that with the committees. But both committees seem to be in favor of moving forward at looking at the impact of cell phone usage in the school district, especially at the middle and high school levels. I also just wanna to add to that, that technology is a much bigger conversation than just cell phones. So that's where we're starting. But I think especially on CNI, there's an appetite for looking at how we use our Chromebooks that are now one-to-one -one in general. Because my understanding from PNL is that the current technology policy was implemented prior to us being one-to-one -one with devices, with Chromebooks for kids, which we now are. So I think there's an appetite to look at how we're using technology overall, but also specifically focusing on um, cell phone use. So we are gonna take a look at that. There are no concrete recommendations yet. There's just an interest to explore the topic more and sort of get feedback from our teachers as to what kind of support they think would be most helpful and any policy changes if needed would then come through PNL. Do any other CNI members have anything to add? Okay. So that was Mrs. CNI. Mrs. This month. Oh, Ms. Stern, I'm sorry. Uh, no, it's okay. I just wanted to add, um, you know, we had all, as you talked about, you know, with the middle level conversation, I mean, all the principals were there. There were other um, staff there from middle level and they were all very clear about this being the right step forward for middle, for middle school. Yes. Um, you know, we, we had some serious conversations and questions previously and that night uh, and a lot of questions about um, the changing of the schedule because it wasn't that long ago that the, the, the schedule was implemented and it was very clear there was unity in, um, about uh, the, the positive value of the schedule, which I, you know, I for one was really glad to hear having Me had three too. kids go through middle school. So, so I, had the, I had the experience of having my oldest be a sixth grader during the previous, previous schedule, and then the change happened for him during seventh grade. So I got to see the current middle level schedule implemented, the change for him. Um, and really these changes they're looking to make at this point are more tweaks to the schedule that's been running for a couple of years now. I think they wanted to see how it went. Um, and again, I think the move to a longer advisory period is beneficial, and not only for music, but there's a lot of other things that happen in advisory, things like social emotional learning, things like collaborative projects that are interdisciplinary. These are the kinds of innovative things we want our middle schoolers doing. And now with an advisory period that's back to what it was before, you'll have more time and space to do those things. And I think a specific intervention period is key for our middle level students so they can help get the help and support they need. Because the thing is in advisory, you never want a middle level student having to choose between going to orchestra or getting extra math help. That's a really hard choice for them to make when they're 12. Um, so now there'll be a dedicated time during the day and they'll also get dedicated enrichment, which I think is really key as they're sort of growing into who they're gonna be at that middle school level. So I'm really excited about it. Like I said, the full presentation is online if anybody has any concerns or questions, but the intention is that these tweaks to the current schedule be implemented in September. Okay, thank you. And now we go to Mr. Greenbaum, if you could please give the business and facilities report. Thank you. 
So in a moment, I will throw this over to Mr. Sugars for uh, a presentation on the budget summary and recommendations. Uh, after that, uh, we'll talk about advocating for school funding and uh, wrap it up with some hopefully good news with bond construction summary. Um, so with that, I will hand this off to Mr. Sugars. So first I wanna say I'm really glad we, we scheduled another budget meeting because we have lots to talk about that we didn't anticipate we were gonna to have to talk about. <clears throat> so first, uh, I know that uh, the, we've certainly had discussions with the board and many people have seen uh, headlines about uh, our funding and what happened. So I, I wanted to start the conversation by just kind of going over um, what happened, where the number changed, uh, so that people understand what we're looking at. So each year when the state determines what the um, aid should be, um, they start by uh, calculating what a district's adequacy budget would be. Um, the adequacy budget is based on our enrollment uh, they weight our enrollment. An elementary student is weighted at a one, a middle school is weighted at a 1.04, a high school student at a 1.16. Um, so they take our, uh, our enrollment and then they weight it based on the number of students that we have in those various grade levels. Now this year also, the total base cost, which is a number that the state provides each year, was increased by the state determined CPI of 5.81%. So one would think that that would be a good thing because the state is at least recognizing uh, that costs are going up. They also then weight students for different um, factors, one being at-risk students, which would be students that are eligible for free and reduced meals, uh, limited English proficient students, special education students, and speech-only students. So they take all of those, weight um, our students, times it by this total base cost, and then they have what they call a geographical cost factor adjustment, which accounts for the cost of living in the county in which the district is located. So this factor then uh, adjusts costs across the different counties. Obviously, um, the north, northern part of the state is gonna have a different factor than the southern part of the state is. Once they determine what your adequacy budget is, and again, that is based on your student enrollment and all of the things that we just discussed, then they have to dis determine what the local cost share is. So what they're looking at with the local cost share is what is the district's ability to pay um, for their local fair share. Um, and that is determined by um, taking a look at our property values, um, which they, uh, which they multiply by, by a property rate multiplier, they divide that in half. And then they look at our district income, that's times a uh, income rate multiplier and divide that by half and take each of those halves and put them together. Now the property values that they, are, they were using in our calculation in 24, 25 were from October of 2023. And our district income that they were using was from 2021. You will recall that we were in uh, still coming out of the pandemic at that point. Um, so in this particular year, when they released the 24-25 state aid figures, 146 districts had their state aid cut, and Cherry Hill was the second largest aid cut in the state. So if we take a look at how some of those numbers changed. So the reason I provided the resident enrollment and the at-risk student number is so that you can see that this is not really based on our enrollment. Our enrollment has fluctuated within the same range. Even our at-risk students have fluctuated within the same range um, over the past couple years. If you then take a look at our adequacy budget, um, you can see that that has gradually increased. It increased last year as well, and then took a, a fairly large jump this year, again, accounting for that 5.81 CPI. Then if you look at the next column and you look at the local share, you can see that that local share has increased over the past years. It took a, 
fairly significant increase in 23-24 of over $22 million. And then, um, I'm sorry, that's our equalization aid. You can see that it took a fairly large increase between 22-23 and 24 from 151 million to 160 million. And then a large jump, 23-24 uh, to 24-25 of 160 million to 182 million. What's interesting here is the fact that in 22-23, we actually received more aid, and you can see that our total aid was significantly higher than it was in 22-23. And then you can see again in 24-25 how we took that, uh, that downturn in what our aid is. And again, if we take a look at this, um, again, as I stated, when they're determining our local share, they're looking at equalized valuation and they're also looking at district income. So if we look at our equalized valuation, we can see that we had a significant increase between 23, 24, um, and uh, we went up over 12 billion in 24, 25. Now this average ratio assessed to true value number means that in 24, 20, again, these are numbers are from October of 23, but as they're calculating our 24, 25 aid, the assessment value of homes were 64% of what the market value was. So essentially what that means is that a home that was assessed at $200,000 was selling for about $300,000. Um, and so um, that was a factor that indicates wealth. Um, and then you can also see there that our um, equalized valuations jumped 11.4 in 2324 and 16.7 in 2425, keeping in mind that in 2324 we saw a significant increase in aid. Um, and that part of the calculation is due to the uh, decrease that we saw that year in our district income. So if you look at our district income over that same time frame, um, we saw a decrease going from 22-23 um, of about 8%, $314 million. And then going into 24-25, um, again, coming out of the pandemic, when you would think that there may not be a, a large increase, uh, you can see that our district income was calculated as over $4 billion and had a $485 million increase. That increase, I believe, in the equalized valuations and uh, particularly in the district income is what affected uh, our equalization numbers um, for this budget year. So if we look at our state aid numbers over the past couple of years, you can see that in 23-24, we received uh, additional equalization aid, again, uh, predicated on those changes in equalized valuation and district income. We also received additional spe special education aid that year. Um, so total aid that we saw an increase in in 23-24 was just under $6.8 million. Um, and, you know, I will say that I was pleasantly surprised by that increase. I We did not anticipate typically when we are Planning our budgets, we start out at flat state aid, um, and then if we receive additional aid, that's always good news. Certainly this year when we started out, we started at flat state aid. We certainly did not in anticipate um, that we were gonna be see a $6.9 million cut in our aid. And you can see here that in 24-25, that reduction in our general fund aid of 6.9 million uh, came in the equalization aid category. Um, at the bottom, we have two new sources of aid that we are receiving from the, from the state, one being debt service aid. That is because of the success, successful bond referendum that we had. Um, we are now given debt service aid to pay back the principal and interest on those bonds. We have um, an increase this year in the principal and interest that's due, and therefore we had an increase in the state aid that we are receiving to pay that back. And we also um, implemented a full day preschool program last year. We have an increase in aid um, and that is based on student enrollment. Um, so we received additional aid in that category. However, um, those two uh, portions of aid, those two types of aid are for very specific purposes and um, cannot, you know, cannot be applied to the general fund 
So therefore, um, as we're going in and planning our budget for next year, we need to account for that difference um, in our budget. So um, as we were planning our budget, um, and again, uh, if we look at total expenditures, and again, these are draft numbers for 24-25 and final numbers for 23-24 because we are in that budget year. If we look at the total expenditures, and again, this was based on um, flat in terms of additional staffing. This was basically creating a budget that was status quo from the 23-24 budget. So if you look at total expenditures and you say to yourself, hey, the budget's going up under $300,000, that's great. But unfortunately, you have to take a closer look um, at some of the things that were going on in the 23-24 budget. So if we flip over out of expenditures and now we look at the revenues that we're using to support those expenditures, and we keep those relatively flat as well, um, there's two areas that we have to take a closer look at, one being the capital reserve amount um, and the other being the decrease in the state aid. So planning our budget for 24-25, we have right now expenditures of $254 million. Um, and basically, if we compare our revenues that we would use to support that budget to the revenues that we use to support the 23-24 budget and leave them relatively static, we have to take a closer look at the capital reserve. So capital reserve in 23-24, we used a significant amount because um, we had the opportunity to take advantage of some ROD grants, both for regular uh, district needs and for preschool needs. And so uh, we allocated a significant amount of capital reserve last year to support those ROD grants. Um, this year, our capital reserve number would be lower um, part of that money would be used to offset some of the impact of the debt service that we have to pay back. Um, but um, the projects that we need to do in 24, 25 are significantly lower. So what you have to keep in mind about capital reserve is that it's on both sides of the balance sheet. So it's on the expenditure side and it's on the revenue side. So um, if we reduce, um, you know, if we, we had to make a reduction because we weren't spending as much on the projects that we were gonna uh, be doing, and that's about 9 million. Fund balance about the same, uh, started out with our 23, 24 taxes at the same uh, level. The cap that we can uh, increase our taxes is 2%, and that's $3.7 million. We added that in. Subtotal there, you can see we've got a difference um, of about 4.8 million. And then state aid, had we had, you know, at least level state aid, um, you know, we still would have had to make some cuts. We still would have had to adjust some things, um, but um, certainly losing that state aid now makes that gap between our revenues and our expenditures much larger. And at the bottom, I put down the numbers without the capital reserve. So you could kind of see just, if we're just strictly taking out those projects and just looking at operational costs, um, salaries, benefits, day-to-day -day operations, you can see that the budget is increasing about 9.2 million, 3.9%. Um, and while that's a large gap that we would, we would have to uh, address, um, it's still below the, the CPI. It's still not um, a terrible increase given the size of our budget. Um, but you also need to note that, you know, that would have been a large gap for us to close anyway without the loss of the state aid. So, um, so that's something that we need to think about as we move forward and as we try to address the issues that we're dealing with for this year. So we have a couple different scenarios that we can take a look at here. The first would be what can we do to um, try to minimize the educational impact or the progr programmatic in impact? We do have one shining little star in all of this news, and that's the fact that um, our health care provider has frozen their rates for 24-25, so our health costs will not be going up for next year um, in terms of premiums. So that is really good news. Um, we have non-personnel area, personnel areas that we will look at first. We always look at our non-personnel areas first. Our goal is always to maintain as many positions as we can. 
And so the areas that we typically look at first are buildings and grounds, technology, extracurricular and athletics, supplies and services. We did the breakdown a couple of months ago of how much discretionary spending we really have. And we all know that we don't have a lot of discretionary spending when we take things like tuition and transportation and utilities and those kinds of things out of the mix of our non-personnel cuts. Um, but there certainly are areas that we will take a look at to make cuts in that area as well. And the other thing that we will do is we will look at um, our revenue side as well. So two areas that we'll take a hard look at is our use of fund balance. You know, uh, those of you that have worked with me for the through the budgets the past couple of years know that I tend to want to keep the fund balance at a low number, um, but we can take another look at that and make some adjustments with how much fund balance we're using. We can also take a look at our extraordinary aid. We tend to be cautious with extraordinary aid because um, we never know uh, it's a next year uh, item for the, for the state budget. We never know exactly how much they're going to allocate, for instance, we haven't even done the application yet for this budget year in 23-24. So we tend to be uh, cautious with how much we use in our budget in the event that we wouldn't get that much. Um, but we do budget below what we'd normally get and we can certainly take another look at that. The other thing that we can consider as we're looking at um, adjusting um, our budget for next year is the fact that we have banked cap. Now banked cap is not a pot of money, it's taxing authority. And the reason we have banked cap is because we did not go to our full 2% increase in previous budget years. So we know that we have about 2.7 million in additional taxing authority um, that we will lose in 24, 25 if we don't use it because it, it has a three year cycle that it goes through. Um, the tax impact of using that is about $77 on the average assessed home. We also have um, banked cap from 25, 26. Uh, that we can use as well. That's about 1.3 million. Um, the tax impact of that would be about $38.65. Now, if we look at the overall tax impact, if we were to, um, to put these measures into place, we're looking at uh, the 2% tax levy increase is about $107 on the average assessed home. The debt service tax levy increase, which really isn't part of our budget process, but we talk about it each year at this time because of the impact is about $101. And the total impact if we were you to use bank cap would be about $324 on the average assessed home. We would still need to make some staffing reductions. We're probably looking at about 18 to 25. Our goal would be to look at our current vacancies and start there. What, you know, do we have vacancies that we have not been able to fill and do we need to fill them? Um, and then also look at our retirements. Um, who do we have that might be retiring? Would we have an opportunity to hire somebody at a, at a much lower salary uh, than maybe the person that is retiring? So we can look at the breakage that we would have between um, those who are retiring and those that would be coming in. And if we can focus on those areas, uh, we think that we can minimize uh, the impact on current staff. Um, so that would be one direction that we could move in as we tackle this deficit. Um, the second area that we could move in, which would be to focus more on the tax impact. Um, again, we, we're starting out with good news with the healthcare provider. Again, we would absolutely focus on non-personnel cuts. Um, we would look at adjusting the other revenue sources. However, we would limit the tax impact to the 2% uh, increase in the tax levy. Um, and between that and the debt service, you would be looking at about a $208 tax impact on the average assessed home. However, um, you would also be looking at um, in reducing uh, positions. And right now we're estimating that that would be about 53 to 60 positions. And we know that that would absolutely impact um, class sizes um, at the various levels, what we can offer at the secondary level, um, you know, basing some of our staffing levels on what's required, not necessarily what's needed. Um, it would definitely affect many of the positions that we've hired in the past few budget years that we have implemented to address student achievement um, and also op uh, our operational staff. 
Um, so it would be across the board. Um, it would be um, hitting each area um, as we would try to spread the, the impact of that out. Again, focusing on vacancies and retirements to try to soften that impact. Um, but definitely um, without using the bank cap, I think we are going to have to be in a position where we're cutting significant numbers of positions. Um, some of the capital reserve things we had talked about. Now, when I talk about using additional fund balance in the, in the budget, um, my concern with that is that uh, not right now, I don't think there's any issues right now, but in the future, um, there could be issues with how much money we can uh, put into our capital reserve. We take it out, you know, we have to replenish it. Um, if we're using more fund balance in our budget, it will affect the amount that we can put into the capital reserve account. Um, we have to think about that as we move forward because although uh, the bond will address many, many of our facilities issues, it will not address all of our facilities issues and we will not be having a bond anytime soon. So um, that's one thing that we need to think about. This was the list that we had presented a couple weeks ago. Um, we will go back and take a look at this list and decide whether we can move ahead with these. Um, we are focusing on things that have to happen. I spoke about the backflow preventers, that has to happen. We are also focusing on projects that will complement the work that we're already doing through the bond, such as the bleachers. Um, and so we'll go back and take a look at that um, and decide you know, if we're comfortable with moving ahead with those or not and how that will affect our capital reserve account. So as we plan, as we move forward, um, obviously we have issues this year that we need to get through, but I, I think also that we need to think about moving forward um, we were on that nice trajectory where we were receiving additional aid each year. Um, and if equalization and district income values are going to have such an effect on us, it's definitely going to hinder our ability to plan for the future. Um, you know, if those numbers, if we had that large of an increase in 2021, what is that going to look like in 2022, 2023, 23, 2024, moving forward as we got further away from the pandemic? Uh, pandemic. Um, we were fortunate this year in, in negotiating with our health care provider. Um, that's not going to be something that we can count on every year, so we need to think about that. 70% um, of our budget is personnel costs, so if we continue to see cuts like this, you know, we can only cut the non-personal area of the budget so much. Um, if these kind of reductions continue, uh, we are definitely going to have to take a hard look at our staffing. Um, and then, again, as I mentioned, the fund balance, um, you know, how that will affect debt repayment. We've made a commitment to offset the debt repayment, um, and how will that affect capital reserve contributions in the future? Right now, we're earning a lot of interest on the bonds that we had issued, so I'm not overly concerned about that at this point. Could become an issue uh, as we move forward. Um, if we assume a higher extraordinary aid number, then we're going to be counting on that being our number each year. And so we, we have to make sure that we're comfortable with that. The other thing is, is that we're kind of using all the tricks in our bag to ad address this issue this year. So if we use all the bank cap, uh, that's good in the sense that our taxable base increases, um, but we won't have that sort of as a um, soft place to land moving forward. Um, and also, I think, you know, as, as you can see, as you look at these numbers, the 2% tax levy cap does not cover the annual increases in the, in the budget. It will cover about 1.59%. Um, and so that's something to think about also as we move forward. Um, you know, increases in the tax levy is not necessarily going to sustain uh, the increases in the budget that we will see. And that's really more a bigger conversation at the state level about, you know, uh, making changes in the formula and make, perhaps making changes in the tax levy cap. So those are things that we need to think about as we move forward, um, not only with this year, but uh, future budget years. So our process is a two-step process. Uh, we have an initial submission budget that's due to the county office on March 20th. We have a board meeting next week on March 19th where we will need to approve at least at this point the initial submission budget, get that submitted so that it can be uh, reviewed by the county office. Once they review and approve it, 
we advertise it, we finalize it, uh, we have the opportunity to make adjustments at that point, and then we ho hold our public hearing, which right now is scheduled for April 30th, and then we have the final board adoption. So um, even if we make some decisions now, should there be uh, changes, you know, at some time in this process, we have another opportunity to make changes before the budget is finally adopted on April 30th. Um, and so I know that's a lot of information all at once. Um, so I'm gonna open it up for any questions that you have. So Mrs. Sugars, I just wanna clarify with you uh, one question. So, cause we, we had this discussion in business in our BNF committee. Um, we really focused on the tax impact of new tax impact. So that would be the, the 2%, which is the cap, mm -hmm. and then the banked cap. I see in the presentation that you have included the tax impact we have already experienced, right, due to the, the bond, which was, you know, voted on and passed mm -hmm. by the by public. So those increases have already come into effect. People have er, are already, that's already incorporated in people's tax um, Correct. So um, if you look at our debt service repayment schedule, we, we have an increase next year in what we're repaying. So we go from about 23 million to 27 million. We then jump up to 29 million uh, in 25, 26, and then we drop back down to 26 million. So that 101 is additional money that will be paid towards the debt service. Again, it's not part of the budget and it was already approved through the referendum process, but when we're looking at the full picture, I think it's important to include that information. Okay, thank you for clarifying that, that's helpful. Um, thank you for that presentation, Ms. Sugars. I'm just looking at uh, closing the gap. Um, non-personnel cuts, what would that look like, especially concerning um, extracurriculars and athletics? Would that be, um, I guess, less field trips, rolling back uh, stipends for advisors, that kind of stuff? It would probably be looking at different offerings and looking at participation in those offerings. Are there things that maybe aren't as subscribed to as much as they used to be? Are there things that um, are really uh, expensive to run that maybe don't have as many participants in it as it did at one time. So we would be focusing kind of on those areas in terms of extracurricular and athletics. Mr. Grimm, I just at some point wanted to mention the efforts that, you know, we've been discussing um, not just on the actual sorting out of the budget in the right direction we want to go in with the budget uh, dealing with the cuts, but also the efforts in the community and the administration and the board are making to um, let the state know that we're not happy. Is this an opportunity for me to do that or? Certainly. Um, so go ahead and I'll, uh, I'll follow up with a call to action. Go right ahead. Um, so I just really want to make it clear, um, and this comes from my own experience um, with people who are in the room who have sat with me side by side um, through previous, you know, pushing for fair funding um, several years ago, um, who've been to budget hearings with us together, um, pushing for fair funding. Um, you know, the effort was not so coordinated back then. And that was, um, as a community member, I know I, I didn't understand that. Um, it's a different time in Cherry Hill. Um, and I wanna be really clear that the board, the administration, um, our PTA, our fair funding committee folks are all um, coordinating our discussions and each doing our different parts to um, strongly push back on these cuts. Um, what that means very specifically is real conversations with our representatives, um, multiple conversations, um, back and forth, explaining where we're at, what we need, what doesn't make sense, 
why this is a problem. And we are definitely being heard. Our Cherry Hill is being mentioned in um, committee meetings. It's being mentioned. Um, we are being um, included in um, conversations at the state level in, in, in certain ways. Um, we have, we're, and, and those of you who are at the RBNF committee, uh, Mrs. Sugar spoke about conversations with our township. Uh, it, this is just a kind of a, as I call it, like a full court press. You know, everyone is working together to coordinate and to, to really advocate for this district um, and to really call out how unfair this is um, after all this time, um, to question the formula the formulae, um, that's not the right terminology, not the formula itself, but to question the, the um, conclusions that have been come to, that have come to, that the, the decision was based on, and to challenge and to ask uh, for relook. Um, every year, districts that have been um, uh, dramatically, you know, affected by their budgets have done a similar, made a similar effort. Um, so I just want to be really clear that we are absolutely very engaged. Um, it's thrown a wrench into many of our um, calendars that we weren't expecting, um, but uh, we're, we're um, responding. And I just really want the community to understand that this is not something that we are sitting back and saying, um, well, someone else has to to work on this. This is something we are all working on together. And I really just wanna express my great gratitude to our community for stepping up and being engaged, um, led by fair funding through zone PTA, um, critical, critical force, um, specifically Dr. Morton, um, <coughs> along with Mrs. Sugars, um, you know, uh, and also um, again, folks at the township who are in support of our efforts. So um, I don't want anyone to, to be under the impression that we are not working very hard um, to do what we can. And I also want to express my appreciation on a personal level to um, you know, the willingness of our local leaders to take our phone calls, to have the conversations, to look at the information that we're um, bringing and hearing you know, our concerns and um, you know, engaging in these dialogues. So um, I have nothing more to report at that point, at this point, but just to say um, this is not okay and we are not, we are not, um, we're not backing away from making that very clear. I'm not sure exactly who the question is for, but um, in a perfect case scenario, do we know what a timeline would look like if your all of this advocacy for Cherry Hill somehow gets through to the people that need to hear it, um, what that would look like? Sure, I can answer that. So, um, as you know, my background was I worked with the legislature, I worked on the budget staffing for lots of years. So I can tell you that changes can and do get made the budget, the state budget that we have is proposed as proposed by the governor. The legislature actually has to adopt the budget. They adopt that June 30th. But in better news than that, last year, the districts who got shortchanged and complained got a supplemental appropriation to go through. It went through very quickly in March and they received their supplemental aid the first week in April. If that timeline were to hold for us this year and they got 66% back of what they lost. So it would be, if, if they were to do that again for us, which I don't know if they will, but we're trying our hardest, we could potentially be notified of that prior to the budget hearing and we could make adjustments to the budget before we have to adopt the final budget. However, we still need to adopt the initial budget on time next week. So the initial budget is gonna look like what it looks like with the allocations the way they are. Um, if we are successful in our advocacy and things change, hopefully it'll change in an early enough timeline that we can adjust that. That is certainly what I'm hoping for. Just also wanted to add, and I apologize for Ms. Gallagher. Um, I was remiss in also not recognizing, as I'm looking over to that side of the room, that our CHEA and all of our collective bargaining units are also a big part of this effort. So I apologize. I did not mean to leave 
um, that very large group of um, folks out. So um, thank you for, <laughs> please understand. <laughs> Just been a lot, lot going on. Um, so anyway, sorry about that. Ms. Gallagher. Yeah, so um, based off of the, the factors that go into equalization aid, um, do you see this potentially being an issue in the future years? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> again, shocked last year that we got the increase that we did. Shocked this year that we got the decrease that we did. Um, because if you look at, like I said, our trajectory, it certainly did not include those kinds of things. Um, when I spoke to um, the township tax assessor, you know, his concern was, well, okay, there's been a real estate boom, but it's not limited to Cherry Hill. Why are, you know, why do our numbers seem to be out of whack um, when you look at the, across the state? So um, yes, I think it will continue to be an issue. I think that um, there has to be <clears throat> something done where district, districts can be held harmless or there could be guardrails put up <clears throat> either in uh, a rolling average for the equalization, a rolling average for the district income, um, and maybe parameters built around how much aid can be taken away all at once um, to, you know, to assist us in, in just being able to plan. Um, how do you, in good conscience, hire staff um, and then you know, know that you may not be able to maintain that staffing moving forward? And then I have a question. So obviously we're receiving like 6.1 million in preschool aid. How much um, out of our general budget needs to go towards uh, the preschool expansion? So there is a certain amount that the district is required to um, put towards um, when we build our preschool budget. Um, there's a certain amount that the district has to allocate towards it um, which basically, I believe the intent, this is our first year going through it, the intent is um, because preschool education aid is only for regular education students and you have um, special education students in an inclusive environment, there's a certain factor that we as a district have to factor in when we're doing that. And I believe that number was just over a million dollars. On top of that, um, in order to uh, cover some of the costs, we had to allocate an additional 500,000 or so on top of that. If you look at the difference in the resolution between um, the total budget and then the allocation, that's the, that's the general fund contribution. But it's broken down into the two pieces, the piece that we're required to have because of inclusion and then the additional amount on top of that. And then what about busing costs? Busing costs are not included. Um, we last year spent about 1.2 million. Now that was for all of our preschoolers. That wasn't just our regular ed preschoolers. That was um, all of our preschoolers in district uh, being sent to our contracted providers and also our special needs um, preschoolers. So um, we are anticipating that's gonna be around 1.4 million for this year. And I asked uh, our transportation supervisor, you know, she, in her, she's feeling that it's about a 50-50 split between our special needs students and our industry and our regular education students. And then of course there's the facility expansion money as well, correct? Yes, so last year we um, applied for a ROD grant. We were given a ROD grant. Um, so that's actually in the 23-24 budget year. Um, they provide 40% of the funding. We have to provide 60% of the funding. Um, and I think that, um, you know, at this point, we've, we've been uh, awarded the funds. Um, we've started to look at, you know, the expansion, what that's going to look like in terms of Kilmer and, and Malbur. Um, and so, um, you know, as long as there's a commitment to preschool, I feel there should be a commitment to keeping district uh, students in district as we are working with the contracted providers um, and seeing what the allocations look like from the state. I think it behooves us to um, keep as many in district as we can. And then one last question, not preschool related. Um, so now of the capital reserve, 
so my question, so technically, so I see like 16 million, that, that's not the, is that the current balance? Or is that the amount that we transferred into the account for capital reserves? So for capital reserve in this budget year, 23-24, yeah, on this page. we had uh, set aside 16 million. Now 12.8, the 12 million is for the Rod grants. We weren't awarded all of the ROD grants. So uh, 3.7 million did not get transferred over because we did not get the ROD grant for some of the non-preschool items that we had applied for. Mm -hmm. um, 4 million is used for debt. So um, that's why the number was so high because of the ROD grants. If we look at this year, that $7 million, 4 million is for the debt repayment and the actual year. projects are a little over 3 million. Okay, that was the question I was gonna ask is if yeah. the 4 million for the bond repayment comes out of that 7 million. Correct. Okay, so that kind of reduces that balance pretty significantly. Like it, 3 million is, if we're, if, what, what is like, what do you want in, I mean, obviously infinite amounts of money would be nice, but like what, what's like a standard practice for capital reserve funds generally? Well, I think it's, it, it really varies because, you know, um, not, not every district has 19 buildings to think about. Um, I think, as I said, you know, at one point, we really relied on it heavily because we didn't have any other resources and our buildings were, as I used to joke, paper gum and bubble, you know, bubble gum and paper clips trying to keep 50 year old unit ventilators going. You know, as, as we move through the bond projects, we will certainly have a lot of improvements in the district and it won't be as critical, um, but, you know, it's not going to cover everything. We're not going to be doing a bond anytime soon. Um, and as I mentioned there, as we go through these projects, um, there's things that, um, you know, either because uh, the scope expanded or because, you know, like, as we had put in there, we're going to do the Crucy gym, but there isn't money in the bond to do the Crucy bleachers. Well, you know, let's finish the project and do it right. And, you know, so we, we would, you know, need funding from someplace else to cover those kinds of costs. Um, so looking at the minimized staff reduction bullet point when you mentioned that we're going to review current vacancies and retirements. Um, do you have any anticipation how much or how many more people we are looking at, um, you know, reducing our workload by? So that's a good question. I mean, we're, we're looking at um, our first thing to do is to look at any position that we've had open for some time that we just have not been able to fill, which, you know, in this day and age is a reality that we have positions that we can't fill. There's some positions that we can't not replace. Um, and then there's some positions that we can take a look at and say, well, is there a different way that we can do this? Um, I've had a, a position in my business office that's been open for some time. Um, we've been able to reallocate um, in the absence of that person, reallocate some of those duties. So we feel comfortable that we can probably eliminate that position. Um, so we're still kind of sorting through all of that. We're still looking at um, potentially making some programmatic changes that would affect that number. Um, but our goal is to try to minimize the impact on actual people that, are, that would have to be rift, minimizing that as much as we can. I don't really have a question, but I have a couple of opinions that I feel like I want to make. Um, unfortunately, the room is filled with people who mostly already care an awful lot about this process and are already doing things. But, um, you know, hopefully we can expand this out to people that aren't in the room and, and haven't traditionally put in as much. But, you know, I, I think what the state has done through their little formula is pretty unconscionable. Um, and looking at the numbers, I see at-risk students has grown by 10%, while even though our, our town's overall income has increased quite a bit, I don't know about most people's households, but my household sure as hell has not 
undergone any major increases in revenue. <laughs> so I don't think that this uh, increase in town revenue is really spread evenly, evenly across the district. And based on the number of at-risk students, I would, I would uh, wager a bet that at the bottom of the income scale, people there's probably there's even more people hurting, and really that income is happening at the top of the income bracket. Um, another and and that's a point that needs to be made, I think, to the state. A second point to be made to the state is who cares if housing prices have gone up? Does has does anybody that wants to be in Cherry Hill benefit from that right now? Like you have to sell your house to get any realized value out of that. Just because your housing value has gone up, that that actually means you have less money because that means you're over, you know, depending on assessments. I mean, I'm, my house just got reassessed, so I'm paying more already on that. You know, so, so increase in housing prices is meaningless to the average person. Their income hasn't increased. We don't have more purchasing power because our house is worth more on Zillow. Like that's, and, and that's a problem in my mind with using, I mean, this is this is getting a little too opinion-y probably, but, but using housing prices as a measure to estimate these things, I think is really inequitable um, because it, it really is, it's putting the pressure on the middle-class homeowner you know, a rich person can buy a three hundred thousand dollar home and and pay minimal taxes. You know that that's not a fair distribution of the burden of the school budget. So I'm I'm really personally against the idea of using housing prices as as, as a measure to to distinguish aid. Housing prices are also very market flexible. And what I mean by that, and I, I'm not a realtor or a business person, but what I mean by that is it's arbitrary. Like, you know, you can go in and offer $50,000 below, you know, the asking price, you know, and they either take it or they don't. And nowadays people are paying thousands, tens of thousands of dollars over asking prices. And that's what's driving prices up. But those are kind of like fake numbers. Those are because you know, everybody wants to get more for their house than they, they bought it for. That's not an equitable way to decide how to ed how to pay for educating children. To, in my mind, it's really terrible. And I think, you know, pointing these flaws in the system out to our legislators, it's really one of the few things that we, we can do. And I think that it's just really important that everybody is getting in on that because our options that have just been laid out that we're gonna, the board's gonna be thinking about an awful lot is we can either um, uh, piss people off by increasing taxes a lot. And I hope it does make people angry. And I hope that anger is directed at the right place, which is the state formula and get it. Cherry Hill has been historically underfunded. The state has not given us what we were owed by, the, by their little formula. And now they're just, and now they're, you know, setting us up for failure with all with our initiatives. You know, what a bad decision. If you formula aside, what a bad decision to give a community a a a, a grant for preschool expansion and rod grants and all of this stu stuff, and then undercut their actual budget by seven million, almost seven million dollars. Stupid, stupid. So. I, I hope that by saying this, you know, I'm not just blowing hot air into the microphone and that, and the, you know, you guys in the audience who I know are already involved and that's, that's part of the problem is, is we're all, we all care already. We have to get other people to care because I think, you know, what I've always been told is that the, the, the legislature doesn't listen very well unless they hear from a lot of people. And the other thing I've been told is they don't really care what we say as, a, as board members. They want to hear from community members. They want to hear from the people who are actually harmed by these, by these things. So I think it's really important that that message gets out. The only way this gets fixed is by people complaining to the state, by people reaching out to their legislators, by people participating in fair funding activities to, to show a, a show of force to the state. And I, I'm sorry, I'm just kind of going on and on, but that, that's my take on the numbers. That's, that, that's what, what I see here. We either increase taxes upsetting and make people mad or 
the other side, which in my mind is worse, we're doing, we're, you know, we've, you know, for two years I've sat here and we've been talking about how do we improve outcomes in the district? Well, it sure hell isn't cutting all this money from the, you know, cutting but people from our budget. It's not getting rid of our math coaches that we just hired. It's not get, getting rid of all of our, our you know, various uh, support staff. You know, teachers, obviously we need teachers in the classroom, but they need their, they need support. And making those big cuts and we will have to make some cuts and that's hard, but the more cuts we make, the more our students suffer for that and the more we undo some of our really important gains that we've gotten. So that that's my, my piece. So thank you for listening. If I can just amplify what Dr. Ru just said, this is not hopeless. This is not hopeless. I have seen it happen. I have seen people go to Trenton, to the budget committees, and make real change for their districts. It happens last year. Districts who went and were loud and expressed what was gonna happen to the students in their district were able to get an extra appropriation to help them with their budgets. I Do I think we're gonna get every penny back? I do not. Do I think any penny we get back is gonna be maybe something else we don't have to cut? I absolutely do. So just to amplify, this is not some pie in the sky Thing. This is not utopia. This is reality. The legislature will listen if we all show up. We always talk about how we have such a huge community, a large school district, and sometimes people talk about it in a negative way. Here's the moment for us to make it positive. We are the 11th largest school district in the state, and we got the second biggest cut from them. Let's show them what that means in terms of impact to our students, because none of the nine of us around here got elected or appointed to cut teachers and raise class sizes. We got elected and appointed because we believe in the public education of our kids. The governor says he believes in it. He says he fully funded education this year. That's great, we agree. Let's fully fund education this year. Uh, I really hear loud and clear from Dr. Wu, Gina, and everybody else, it is a true thing that we should all present ourselves a trend if you can all go. And if you can, talk, if they allow you to talk, that'd be great. But if not, observe, you'll find that I was there with Marion five, six years ago. And unfortunately, this time I cannot make it. But I would like as many people as they can go there and support the Cherry Hill Township. All right, that's it for me. Thank you. I just like to support um, basically everything Dr. Root said. Um, I forget who else it was that that asked, um, could this be an issue in the future? Um, but it definitely could be if, if we continue using this formula. Then um, if, if we just use like a reactive solution where we just have to go to the the state assembly each year and and ask for more funding, this is not going to truly really solve the issue. It's just going to um, mean that we're scrambling to kind of react to the issue as it comes up because as we've seen, it's been um, extremely unpredictable uh, our funding from year to year. Um, so because of that, I think uh, one of the biggest efforts that we should focus on is uh, really making our concerns with the system used to, to um, determine state aid known. That way, this isn't an issue in the future. Um, I'm also like happy to say that uh, Colin and I are working to um, organize a contingency of students to go to the uh, state assembly on March 20th. So we'll be happy to testify and attend there um, later this month. I'm very <clears throat> grateful to you guys, and I'm sorry that you have to take time out of your weekday, of your school day, to be honest. I mean, I know you're seniors, and so I'm not sure how much schoolwork is, is very um, intent and heavy right now, although it might be kind of a lot of exams and stuff coming up in May. But um, I do want to thank you guys, and I, I do want to say that um, many, several of us are, you know, at, every board member has been invited, I, after several of us are going. This is, am I stealing your thunder, Mr. <laughs> Green? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop and, sure. and turn it over to you, Mr. Green. So this, I think this is a good time to interject with a call to action to help advocate for school funding. Uh, there continues to be some amazing collaboration between board members, students, the administration, uh, Zone PTA, the Fair Funding Committee, our mayor, our local legislators. They are here. They're listening to us. 
Uh, one way to get involved is through the Fair Funding Committee. They've been doing a really great job at getting information out there on what you can do with specific actions, phone numbers, email addresses, scripts. Um, you could find them on Facebook. There's a Fair Funding Facebook page, very easy to find. Uh, if you go to the district's website, you can go under the Community tab, and that'll bring you to the Fair Funding website. A um, little different information than on the Facebook page, but it has the same call to action on it. Um, there are opportunities to testify in front of the assembly. I know I'll be there next week on the 20th. Um, it looks like slots that you can reserve to testify are all filled up, but you could still go there in person if we show up in numbers. Uh, it provides good optics that, hey, we're here, we all care, please give us some, some more funding, or I should say restore our funding. Um, there's also Tuesday tweets, Friday phone calls. I know I started last Friday making calls to all of our lawmakers following a simple script and they were very receptive, very polite and passed those messages along. Um, I think that covers it. Please get involved. The more people they hear from, they don't just wanna hear from our leaders, they wanna hear from everybody. The more, they, the more people reach out, the more hopefully they will hear us and restore our funding. I believe the funding formula is getting revisited next year. If we can communicate to them what's wrong with it and how it impacts us and most importantly our students, hopefully we could see some positive changes. I, I think the piece about showing up in numbers, whether or not people are testifying because they the um, the committee has asked us to limit our, our actual time in testifying because there's a lot of other people who are testifying too. So. Um, but, you know, having, as Ms. Ms. Tong referenced, I mean, having gone to budget hearings and, and seeing small districts that have a thousand students show up with 50 people in matching shirts and Cherry Hill, I think our greatest number of the one year, we might have had 12 people, 15 people, which was great, but um, very small compared to a lot of other districts. And it was noticeable that we were a absent relatively absent for our size that can't happen this year we have we really really need people and I know it's hard many of us work full-time full-time plus and we have kids I'm in the same boat um, you know if you can be a presence in the afternoon of the 20th that is our testif uh, testifying time is in the afternoon on the 20th up in Trenton um, and then there's the uh, Senate hearing which is online is it the 26th 26? 26. Thank you. That's online. So you just have to log in and write your name in Cherry Hill after that. I won't ask you if you're actually listening or not. You just got to be online. Okay. Don't, don't let anybody know I said that. Um, this is being recorded. Oh, well, too late. Uh, it'll be our secret, right, Mr. Green? <laughs> Thank you. So, um, you know, please get the word out. And it, yeah, that, I just wanted to add that. So thank you. Thank you very much. So hopefully we'll see a bunch of you out on the 20th, uh, but definitely look up fair funding, follow some of the actions that, uh, that they share throughout the week. Uh, hopefully by showing up in numbers and calling and emailing and tweeting, they see that we, we mean it, we need, we need our funding restored. All right, with that, I will move on to some good news with bond construction summary, because no matter what they do to our budget, they cannot touch the bond funding. That money is allocated for those projects and cannot be used for anything else, but also cannot be taken. Uh, I'll give a little briefer summary than I had planned because we've been talking for a while. Uh, roofing projects have been done for a long time. Uh, but we're finally receiving closeout documents from all three contractors. Uh, the Prevco contract closeout, I believe, is on the agenda tonight. Uh, you may have seen a lot of great improvements at the High School East Stadium. Lots of great work there, including grandstand, press box, risers. Everything is fully accessible. It's something that's important to me and to a lot of other people, uh, including removal and replacement of squares of sidewalk that were not compliant just due to the slope. Um, the close to the finish line, they expect substantial completion by March 20th, so next week, and should be usable in time for the game on April 2nd. A lot of great progress on APRs. Five out of six building pads have been completed. There's some site work needed uh, to prepare for that. The soil condition was the biggest unknown, so not expecting a lot of change order requests moving forward, but saying that out loud probably just invited uh, a lot of new challenges. <laughs> um, 
Electrical contractors started second shift work running new conduits. Uh, There's gonna be some abatement work uh, that needs to be done when tying into some of the schools, but still on schedule for May of 2025, some even sooner. Uh, I'll give a disclaimer, that's not an official date, but that is the current expected timeline. Uh, Carusi, the plans are out to bid for work as of February 29th. There's a lot of interested parties hoping for competitive bids. Uh, the Office of the State Controller gave approval to, to post it, so uh, hoping for some uh, competition there, which hopefully means better pricing for us. Uh, unions are fully engaged on abatement efforts starting this summer. Uh, Carusi has a lot of abatement work. Uh, we're looking at two crews from two companies to ensure work is completed on time while the buildings are empty. Early childhood additions, that's the preschool expansion at Melberg and Kilmer. Uh, it's actively being worked on. Uh, with site drawings and construction documents being reviewed. Critical HVAC that we talked about recently, uh, East Boiler Room has a small amount of abatement that's going to be done on March 29th uh, during uh, spring break when the buildings are empty. It's necessary to be able to prepare for future work over the summer. Uh, East is the biggest project, but also working in 10 other buildings this summer in order to do critical HVAC repair and replacement. Uh, at Rosa, schematic drawings are out for construction and reconfiguration for the rest of the building, and that's expected to go out for bid in September. Um, with West Site Work, uh, at our last meeting, we talked about a recreation grant that was submitted to offset the costs, which includes accessibility improvements. That's work already being done, but always appreciate our administration, our construction company, for going after every last penny that we could find. Um, and lastly, something interesting that came up is at High School East, in an intro to engineering class, there's a request for uh, garrison architects to come in and work with the students to teach them what this construction work looks like, how they prepare, uh, show them how this works in the real world. Uh, so Bob Garrison talked about how he's excited to work with the students, uh, talk about reviewing the process, probably using F-Wing as an example. And I think that about covers it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we move on to human resources, which is the art. I, that's the committee that I lead. Um, and so as people know, there's really not a lot I can usually say, um, but I can share that we um, focused our discussion in job descriptions, um, which we will be voting on tonight. Um, so. That's pretty much all I can say. Obviously, recruitment's a big thing, although challenging times to talk about recruitment. Uh, this meeting occurred before our funding numbers came out, so that's it. And now we move on to um, policy and legislation. Uh, Mrs. Winters, if you could please uh, give the committee report. Sure. I subbed in for Joel, who was judging DECA, I believe. No? He's at a work uh, obligation. No, at PNL. And I subbed in as chair for PNL. Yes, I'm right. Okay. <laughs> Last week he was in Atlantic City doing DECA, and today he's in Chicago. Correct, correct. He was in. He, that, that's right. He's, it's he's like where in the world? On. Where in the world is Joel? Um, so I got to chair PNL, which was a lot of fun. We were excited to welcome Ms. Niaz as the newest member of the committee. Um, Ms. Weddington started by giving us a legislative update. And then we moved into some policy updates from Strauss Esme. I did tease Joel quite a bit about the number of policy updates he left me. This was not something he told me was gonna happen before I said I would sub in as chair, but fortunately most of them were quite easy um, and just updates to the language. So we had a few minor questions, but nothing huge with that. After that, we moved into the Comprehensive Equity Plan, which Ms. Weathington explained to us and gave a copy to us to review. We then went into old business in which we discussed one of my favorite things to discuss, which is the school calendar. Ms. Gallagher and I, of course, had opinions about how spring break should be conducted. <laughs> what can we say? We always provide entertainment for the crowd. Um, but the 26, 27, I'm sorry, the 24, 25 calendar, which is next year was discussed at an LMC meeting that I was at with, um, Dr. Morton and a lot of other people and the LMC put together some ideas for next year's calendar, including moving to 180 student days and taking the two additional days and using them for prof professional development, because there's a huge need for that in the district. 
Um, the LMC agreed that was a good idea. It was presented to PNL. The PNL committee also agreed it was a good idea. So that looks like it's in process with the final calendar. We then talked about the following year, which is 26, 27, um, which is gonna be another year where spring break looks like it might be split because Easter and Passover do not align. So we suggested that the LMC and all of their wisdom take a look at that as well, since the process worked so well for the 24, 25 calendar to see what the best way of managing that is. Um, so that's coming up. The last thing that we did, and I touched on this in CNI, is we discussed the cell phone policy. So it was a cross committee discussion and collaboration. Like I mentioned before, both committees agreed the best idea was to discuss with the teachers first and see what their experiences are and then move to the students in the full community. Anything else from PNL members? Did you mention that those extra PD days eliminate the half days in high school? I did not, but that is an excellent point. Thank you. This is why it's a team effort. Yes, so the, the Friday half days that we put in this year for extra PD and collaborative time at the high school with the addition of the two days um, that we'd be giving teachers for PD, we wouldn't have to do that anymore. And I think it also will significantly help with our preschool program because there's a lot of required PD for that program as well. And the teachers were asking for additional time to get up to speed on all the requirements, the things they have to do. So I'm really hopeful that that's gonna make a big difference for our teachers next year. Any questions, other questions? Colin. I probably misunderstood you, but um, the early dismissal PD days for next year, they're going away. And you're gonna get two additional days off, you're welcome. Oh wait, you okay. won't, you'll graduate, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank you. My son was also quite confused. He's like, you're taking away the half day Fridays. I was like, it's not taking it away, it's substituting in the two additional days. I'm sorry, you'll miss that excitement. Um, I think that we were talking about which days those were gonna be, and I don't believe that there was a conclusion fully come to that's gonna go back to LMC. Um, there were a couple of ideas floating around as to what would be best and most productive. Some of the things they were thinking about is positioning the days earlier in the year, that way the teachers can get the most impact out of the professional development and then deploy that to the students. I was talking to some board members when I went to the LMC training and they were saying how their district does all their PD after school ends in June and it's totally not productive because everything you learn like June 20th and you have to wait till September to implement it. Whereas we tend to space them out throughout the year. That way people can take what they're learning and immediately try it out, which is kind of neat. Any other questions, thoughts? I'm really excited about it, actually. I think we're really investing in our teachers. And I think also just the collaboration with the LMC of the teachers and the, not just the teachers, the teachers, the administration, the educational assistants, everybody being part of the conversation is, I think, really interesting because you get that perspective from everybody and that makes the decisions better and easier when we all come together and discuss it. There are things that I absolutely did not know or ever think about about the school calendar, but when you're sitting in the room with all the stakeholders and you get that input and collaboration, then the decisions make a whole lot more sense. Um, like an old board member used to say, she used to say, make it make sense, Ms. Elmar Stratton. So I'm trying to make it make sense all the time for you now. Anybody else? All right, that's PNL. Okay, great, thank you. And now we move on to Dr. Rood, if you could please give the strategic planning report. Sure, I'll try to be brief. Um, so the first thing we talked about was the demographic study that the district is having done. Um, Dr. Grip has completed his study um, and there is a plan to, um, uh, he, he plans to present that on the April 9th board meeting. Um, so we'll hear about the demographic study that, of course, is important um, in kind of planning for the future and kind of trying to get an idea of like the number of students in district and the, and the kind of distribution throughout town so that we can kind of think about um, uh, enrollment numbers. Uh, the next thing uh, was the communication audit. Uh, phase one of the audit, audit, which is focus groups and surveys, is complete. Um, both uh, district administration and the um, and the audit uh, company were very pleased that there was a very uh, large uh, uh, number of surveys completed. So that um, so thank you to the community for contributing your your voice to 
um, to this audit. Um, let me see. So our um, administrators are in conversations with the auditors. Um, it says in my notes next week, which is this week. Um, and they're, uh, ho we're hoping to get a draft of the report um, sometime in May. So we should be hearing about that communications audit, which is a comprehensive survey of communication in the district. And this, um, in this audit, um, they'll be making recommendations for um, based on all of the feedback that they received um, for making uh, positive impro improvements um, to the district. Um, next, we heard from um, Allison Staffen, who spoke about a climate change education and resilience grant that the district uh, submitted on February 28th. Um, the application um, is part of a, a larger grant opportunity throughout the state. The state has put up about $2 million and plans to split that into about 80 awards. So. It'll be a, a nice little pot of money if, if we receive the award. And the, the idea that they put forward in the application was building off of a project done at, at Rosa Middle School last year where uh, they uh, put together pollinator, uh, a pollinator garden. Um, and so we're hoping, and so this grant would allow for um, institution of pollinator gardens at uh, most of our district's building, I th building district buildings, I think that's the plan, and um, that would kind of uh, integrate nicely with um, what the district sustainability committee is currently working on with their plan to to um, provide a sustainability um, plan for the district. So that they were consulted on this grant, and um, uh, the the pollinator gardens. Um, they're kind of a, 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 I think, a really fun I, idea for kids, and they offer a lot of opportunities um, that meet a lot of our district goals. Um, they offer educational opportunities. Um, they help teach kids about wellness. If one of, if you, if you follow the bi biology in news, um, we often hear about failing populations of bees. And that may seem kind of like, you know, like, oh, who cares about bees? Well, we all do because bees are important for crops and all kinds of things. So without proper pollinators, crops fail and people starve. So it's an important problem around the world and something that our, our, our kids are able to make a little bit of an impact at their um, home schools um, if, if we get this grant. So that's, that's really exciting. Um, and it also, there's, there will be interactions with different, um, it would enable interactions with community garden centers. And, and that is, of course, fits in with our, our um, kind of a, a career and technical training initiatives and uh, getting kids to interact with other uh, groups in the community. So a lot of, a lot of good things in, in that grant application. It, it sounds small, but it's really, a, would be a really uh, nice thing for the district. Um, let me see. We briefly in old business mentioned cell phones only to say that our, thankfully our discussions in strategic planning have moved up to policy and legislation and curriculum and instruction. And we're taking a more active look at cell phone usage, um, especially kind of uh, building off of uh, community feedback through. Um, so that's, that's a really good thing. And during public comment, we talked a little bit about the, the decline in bees. <laughs> um, that, that's it. Any questions? Uh, any other comments from other strategic planning people? No? No? I just okay. want to yeah. comment that I really appreciate um, how active and significant the work you guys are doing in strategic planning is. You know, there was a period of time where strategic planning didn't have a lot of substance to the conversations. It's just completely different. And I really appreciate, um, you know, you guys on the committee and doing the work that, you know, <laughs> but yeah, they, uh, you know, are doing. So thank you. 
Um, okay, now we move on to our special action agenda and we will start with curriculum and instruction. Mrs. Winters, can you please move the CNI agenda? I would be delighted. The superintendent recommends and I move the following 17.1 approval of attendance at conference and workshops for the 23-24 school year. 17.2 resolution approving early childhood preschool budget 2024-25. 17.3 resolution authorizing submission and acceptance of the teacher climate and culture innovation grant and 17.4 approval of professional service agreements for the 23-24 school year. Do I have a second? Dr. Rude, are there any questions? No questions. Ms. Sugars, can you please open the voting? Board members, you may catch your votes. Now you may catch your seat. I'm voting no on 17.2. I will be no voting no on 17.2 as well. I'm gonna vote no on 17.2. Okay, other than the three no votes on item 17.2, the motion carries. Um, we have all, all of the uh, items carry. Thank you. Okay, we move on to business and facilities. Mr. Greenbaum, can you please move the BNF agenda? Thank you. The superintendent recommends and I move the following. 18.1, approval of bill lists. 18.2, resolution of the Cherry Hill Board of Education accepting the whole of the work of Pravco Inc. on bid 2223-34. Do I have a second? Ms. Stern, any questions? Mrs. Sugars, please open the voting. Board members, you may cast your votes. And the motion carries. Okay, I'm gonna move the CNI, I'm sorry. Human resources agenda. Uh, the uh, acting superintendent recommends and I move the following. 19.1, termination of employment certificate. 19.2, termination of employment non-certificated. 19.3, appointment certificated. 19.4, appointments non-certificated. 19.5, salary change certified, uh, certificated. 19.6, assignment salary change non-certificated. 19.7, other compensations certificated. And Mr. Green, is, is the right language uh, still apply of the, I, I need to read out this whole, I should read this one out separately, is that correct for 19.8? Uh, it's not necessary technically, but you certainly can if you wish to. Okay. Um, then I will leave it at 19.8 if it's not necessary. Um, and do I have a second? Mr. Greenbaum, are there any questions? Ms. Gallagher? Um, Mr. Green, a question about 19.8 for point of order. Is this a simple majority or a majority of the full board? It's a simple majority of those present and voting. And do abstentions count for? Abstentions are not votes, so. They don't count towards the vote total. Are there any other questions or comments? Mrs. Winters? I'd like to comment on 19.8. So about a year ago, we all woke up on a Monday morning to the news that Dr. Malash was retiring as superintendent. And I should have expected that because I had said to my husband the night before that it was going to be a quiet week. As we all absorbed the news, the board members quickly came to the realization that hiring a new superintendent to lead our district was quite possibly the most important decision we would ever make as a board. We resolved to do it well and to find the right person to lead Cherry Hill forward into its next era of success for all of our students. 
It was really important to us that community voice be paramount as we moved forward with the process. To help us, we hired a professional search firm so that we could be sure to accurately capture the aspirations our community has for a new leader and for the district as a whole. We asked and you answered us. I want to thank every single person who took the time to give us input. We know you're busy and that there are many competing demands on your time every single day. But we also know that this is a community that cares deeply about its public schools and will always step up when needed. Over 1,300 of you completed the survey and more than half the respondents, the largest stakeholder group was our students. The second largest group, almost 30% of respondents were parents. Many more of you attended focus groups and meetings to tell us what you hoped for in a new leader. And this is what you said. You asked us for a leader who would foster a positive professional climate of mutual trust and respect among faculty, staff, and administrators. I have watched Dr. Kwame Morton use the Labor Management Collaborative to create exactly this kind of environment. Joel and I are now the board representatives to the LMC and have seen up close how much better things are when all of the stakeholders are working together in a collaborative environment towards mutual goals to move our district forward. You asked us for a leader who would understand and be sensitive to the needs of a diverse student population. Dr. Morton has a history of this through his tenure as a principal up until today. He's an empathetic leader who seeks to understand the diverse backgrounds of all of our students and create an environment where everyone is included and belongs. He has implemented the NJ Sky Climate Survey in all of our schools and is now using that data to create school-based plans so that our students can feel safe and welcomed in our school communities. You asked us for a leader who will provide transparent communication. Under Dr. Morton's leadership, the district is currently conducting a communication audit so that we can improve our communication with you. I can also say that on a board level, the transparency and communication between the board and the administration has been excellent. The robust conversations we have had around the NJSLA data and how we can continue to positively impact student achievement in our district are a key example of that. You asked us for a leader who demonstrates a deep understanding of educational research and emerging best practices and can implement strategies. Under Dr. Morton's leadership, Cherry Hill is on the cutting edge of innovation in education. High impact tutoring, universal preschool, and of course, our well-loved high school math pathways are just a few examples of systemic and data-driven initiatives that Dr. Morton has implemented in just the past few months. And finally, you asked us for a leader who would provide a clear and compelling vision for the future. Dr. Morton's heart is truly here in Cherry Hill. He knows and he loves this district and its students. He has watched the district change and grow over the past 16 years and has concrete plans on what we need to do to continue to evolve into the Cherry Hill of the future. Cherry Hill, you asked, we listened, and we delivered. I could not be more thrilled to work with Dr. Kwame Morton to continue to move towards the future of this wonderful school district we are so incredibly proud of. Mr. Greenbaum. So I'd like to share a moment I found inspirational while working with Dr. Morton. When we were in the process of putting together the application for preschool expansion aid, uh, I asked a number of practical questions about funding streams, transportation, logistics, and I, I got satisfactory answers for all of my questions, but that was the how. When Dr. Morton responded, he spoke to why. He talked about the importance of early childhood education and the advantage children with access to it have over their peers. He spoke about closing achievement gaps and how we can't just focus on adding supports at the middle school and high school levels, but also need to close the opportunity gap when it comes to early childhood education. He talked about the importance of special education and early identification of any supports that are needed so children have the tools they need to succeed when they enter kindergarten instead of trying to catch up on lost learning later. He understands why we do what we do and he brings his passion for education to everything he does. 
and he embodies the characteristics the community said they were looking for in a superintendent. For these and many other reasons, I'm excited to select Dr. Morton as the next superintendent of Cherry Hill Schools. Mr. Fain? Um, I was asked to not comment on my vote tonight, but I see that other people are commenting on their vote. So I would just like to know that the vote, I would just like the public to know because accusations um, seem to have already been made about what potential votes could be. Um, my, I, my vote tonight will be under the oath that I took when I first was appointed back in January under the New Jersey Code of Ethics for school board members, um, section 18A colon 12-21. Point one dash H is the reason for my vote tonight. Any board members? I have a um, a comment um, that uh, Mr. Mayor asked me to read since he was not here tonight. He uh, asked that I read it on his behalf. Anyone who knows me knows that I do not that I don't do scripts and don't draft comments or speeches. So it's ironic that I'm drafting this one now. One that I wish I could give in person, but I'm conducting resiliency training outside of Chicago this week for public school teachers. And I'm grateful for that opportunity, though not for the timing. I am completely in support of advancing the contract appointing Dr. Morton to the county superintendent for her review and approval and thank the team at Hazard Young and Atia for their hard work and expertise in, work, in working with community stakeholders to craft the candidate profile, in fielding a robust and varied list of interested candidates from across the region and country, for carefully vetting those candidates, and for applying their expertise and experience to provide the board with a truly impressive list of finalists. Even with HYA's assistance, this was difficult and time-consuming work, but it should have been. It's that important. Thank you to my fellow board members for your countless hours, your attention, and your dedication. The work was hard, but in the end, for me, the decision wasn't. In the several months that I've had the privilege to work and observe, work with and observe Dr. Morton, in his capacity as acting superintendent, I've seen unwavering passion, short and long-term strategic thinking, a comprehensive grasp of the many and varied needs and challenges faced by this district, and a stunning capacity for identifying growth opportunities at the staff and programmatic levels. Dr. Morton is a leader among leaders who earns the respect of his peers and the district staff every day. I say all the time that settling for success will only hold you back. Dr. Morton, you don't settle for success. And because of that, with you at the helm, Cherry Hill Public School District will not be held back. Those are Mr. Mayor's comments, not mine. <laughs> However, I do have my own and I'm thrilled to be able to share them. Eight months ago, we embarked on a daunting journey to find our next superintendent. We carefully chose the highly regarded national search firm, Hazard Young, Atia, and Associates to lead this journey. HYA rigorously conducted an inclusive engagement process of Cherry Hill stakeholders. And I wanna take this moment to thank the Cherry Hill stakeholders, some of whom are in this room tonight, some of whom are online, and some who are out there who I've never met, to thank them for their time and engagement. Out of that process, they developed the desired superintendent characteristics, posted on, which is now posted on, um, which was posted on our website, which became the board's guide to hiring our next superintendent. The community's charge was clear. Cherry Hill wanted a strong educational leader who is engaged, collaborative, and transparent. Words we have heard over and over and over again tonight. Someone with leadership experience in districts of comparable, 
of comparable size and complexity to Cherry Hill. A relationship builder, a transparent communicator, and someone who has a track record of closing achievement gaps among diverse groups of learners. HYA presented materials from the 38 candidates who completed their applications, drawing from 13 states. HYA brought a slate of 10 recommended highly qualified candidates for the board to carefully review and then choose our top five to interview for the first round and then three for the final round. Let there be no doubt that every board member participated in each step of the process, sharing honestly and openly about our assessments of the candidates, their materials, and their interviews, and comparing that with the desired characteristics that the community gave us. With 16 years of demonstrated leadership in our large district, as a systems thinker who uses best practices and data to improve student achievement, and with the added strength of having a background in business and budget management, which very few people may be aware of, Dr. Morton's competencies, his vision, and his strengths clearly differentiated him as the right leader to take Cherry Hill Public Schools to new levels of success. Dr. Morton said this about the cornerstone on which he serves, and I quote, by merging an understanding of educational research with a systems thinking approach, I have been able to utilize a deep understanding of sound business principles to create 21st century learning communities committed to equitable outcomes for all students, unquote. And indeed, in his 16 years in this district, his actions as a leader in our district demonstrates this. I am thrilled, and I was tough to, I'm a tough critic, as you certainly know, and as my fellow board members know, I am thrilled to wholeheartedly support you as the right leader in the best interest of our students and this district and to send your contract to the county the executive county superintendent any other board members any comments or the student who'd like to make a comment please feel free back in <clears throat> In May, when I interviewed for the board rep position, uh, the question was raised, what are you looking for in our new superintendent? And I said, a compassionate leader. And that's exactly what we have in Dr. Morton. Whenever Dr. Morton is in the building, he's talking with students, he's getting to know them, he's getting to know what they like, and, and I see it. And it's great to see that the students get to interact with an administrator from such a high level and, and feel heard and feel understood. Uh, and I, I think it really says something that uh, the great work that uh, Hazard Young and Atia did in our nationwide search, and we still ended up right back here in Cherry Hill with Dr. Morton. And I think that says something. Thank you. Uh, congratulations, Dr. Morton. I'd also like to start out by saying um, congratulations, Dr. Morton. Um, I remember back at the start of this year when we had the uh, focus groups with the Hazard Young and Atia and Associates. Um, and one of the most common things that students were talking about was the importance of the new superintendent, um, the importance of, of that role, of having someone who really understood um, what the Cherry Hill community was like, um, the size, the, the diversity, and the structure, the, the, the emphasis on the educational system. And, um, I really was, was worried about um, the idea of, of taking someone from outside the district because that's such a difficult process of kind of accustoming someone into an entirely new community, um, as, which is already a difficult process for anyone to, to come into a new role. Um, so I'd just like to say that I'm, I'm very thankful that we have someone who has such a, a proven track record in the district, um, who has years of, of service to uh, our school district. Um, and another very, very um, heavily repeated phrase was the idea of like listening, like, like Colin said. Um, 
and through everything that I've seen from Dr. Morton and everything that I've heard about Dr. Morton's service, um, I think he embodies that, like truly, truly embodies that. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Mrs. Sugars, can you call the vote, please? Board members, you may cast your votes. Mrs. Sugars, I have to abstain from 19.1 for a conflict of interest, and I will be a no on 19.8. Voting no on 19.8. Mrs. Sugars, I am abstaining from 19.6 and 19.8 due to conflict of interest. Uh, Mr. Chick, I need to abstain from 19.3 and 19.8. Thank you. Okay, for 19.3. One, we have one abstention. 19.6, we have one abstention. 19.3, we have one abstention. 19.8, we have two no votes and two abstentions. Uh, all motions carry. Thank you, Mrs. Sugars and Dr. Morton. We are very excited to be able to say that we are advancing the contract to the county executive superintendent. More to come on that. <laughs> okay, we move on to policy and legislation. Mrs. Winters, can you please move the PL agenda? The superintendent recommends, and I move the following 20.1 approval of harassment, intimidation, bullying, investigation decisions, and 20.2 approval of harassment, intimidation, and bullying hearing decision. Do I have a second? Ms. Sherfane, are there any questions? Ms. Sugars, can you call the vote, please? Board members, you may cast your votes. Ms. Sugars, I will be abstaining from 20.1 and We have three abstentions. Um, Mrs. Niaz, Dr. Rood, and Mrs. Tong. The motion carries. Okay, we have 21.1. I'm sorry, 21 strategic planning. There is uh, nothing to move on that agenda. We now move to new business. Is there any new business? Mrs. Gallagher. To make this really, really short. Um, I've just been like reviewing policies and stuff and our bylaws need to be updated. They don't reflect changing that we've changed some policies over the last couple of years. So our bylaws do need to be updated. So I think would that go to like PL, I assume? Yes, if you could please take that back to PL. And you're on PL, is I that am, correct? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So yeah. if you could um, get with the PL chair, uh, Mr. Meyer, and have that conversation. All right, perfect. Thanks. Any other new business? And do we have any other old business? Okay, uh, we now move on to our second public comment. Turn my page over. This is our second public comment section during which you may comment on any school related topic. If you would like to speak now, please clearly state your name and municipality. We will alternate between speakers here in the room and those who are online. Each speaker will be given a maximum of three minutes to speak. The timer on the screen will indicate the amount of time you have remaining. Public comment is an opportunity for members of the community to comment on matters relevant to the operations of Cherry Hill Public School District or within the authority of the Cherry Hill Board of Education. The board welcomes diverse opinions on relevant matters. Under established federal law governing reasonable restrictions on speech and public forums, Statements which demean individual community members or groups or which are irrelevant to the operations of the school district or are repetitive will not be permitted. 
Community members who would like to present information not relevant to the school district are always welcome to communicate directly with the, with the acting district superintendent, board president, and all board members via email or other alternative means. So um, as always, we offer students to go first. I, at 9.45 at night, I really hope there aren't too many students who wanna make a public comment, but if there are, they're obviously gonna be first. And if you're a student and you're online and you'd like to comment, I don't mean to, um, to deter you. I just hope that you have been able to get, you'll be able to get some good sleep. Um, but if you are a student and you're online and you'd like to speak, please put an S after your name so we get to you first. Uh, we will start in the room. So if you'd like to speak, uh, make a public comment about matters relevant to our school district, please approach the podium, state your name and municipality. Hi, my name is Cole Allen Johnson. Um, I am in Morristown, New Jersey, um, so not too far away. Um, I'm coming to you all today um, in regards to an issue I'm very concerned about, and that is our children's unprecedented access to hardcore internet pornography. Um, right now, there are no regulations stopping children from accessing this content. Um, any child can go to these websites. Only 3% of them even ask you if you are 18. Of the ones that do, you can click simply just click, yes, I'm 18, and gain access to the site. This is absolutely wreaking havoc on all of our children's mental health, uh, their loss of innocence at a young age. It's causing them to engage in sexually abusive behavior with one another, body image disorders, lack of drive for real intimate partners, isolation from family and friends, to just name a few of the mental health impacts that it has. Um, what I'm coming to you today is to see if you would all be interested in supporting my initiative by calling an assembly of the parents of the children um, on, on an off day when the kids aren't here at night, I'm simply offering it to the parents that I will come and speak and spread awareness about a piece of legislation which passed in eight states in 2023 alone where adults have to provide a photo ID or some proof of ID to gain access to these sites. Um, and, uh, you know, th this is really the only way to get the word out about this legislation since the media isn't covering it at all. At this point, I've literally talked to over a thousand people about this issue. Nobody knows that this legislation got passed in, in eight states in 2023 because of the complete media blackout on the issue. Meanwhile, we know about every single state that paces, um, passes legislation legalizing marijuana instantly. It's all the media will talk about, but this, for whatever reason, they're totally silent on. So this is the only way we can get the word out about it. I think it's the most crucial thing um, is preserving our children's innocence, and we just simply can't say that we're doing it. It makes absolutely, uh, with, with, with uh, the way things are right now, it makes absolutely no sense that you should have to provide ID to gain access to a strip club, but any 12-year-olds can uh, hop on one of these sites where they will see content that is far more graphic than anything they would stumble across in a strip club. Um, so uh, the average age that a child is exposed to this content is at 11 years old, and most kids aren't just going to be exposed at that age. They're going to get addicted to it, as I was and many other children my age uh, were. So um, I would encourage you all to consider um, possibly giving me an opportunity to, once again, speak to the parents of the children of your school district um, on and off night where I can uh, uh, give them a presentation about the legislation, how they can all help to get it passed in the state. So um, thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. Okay, we go to the line and it's a number 788. I'm sorry, you cannot hand those out to us, please. If you have any materials for us, you can hand them to Mrs. Sugars, please, our business administrator, and board secretary. Thank you. Uh, the number is, I'm going to wait a second. Yes. Uh, so we go to the line, and the number is 788. Uh, as soon as the timer is... Hi, my name is Jeff Potowitz. I live in Cherry Hill, sorry, could you, New okay. Jersey. Okay, my name is Jeff Potowitz. I live in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. First, you hear me? First, you hear me? First, please read the transformation of state aid since 1990. NJ Education Aid, uh, Paul, on his blog, July 20th, 2016, since 1989 to 1990. All right. We have been the Cherry Hill has been the biggest loser in dollars of state aid. All right. 
um, for the whole state. Um, the state. The state saved a lot of money as a result, and we paid the costs. Um, and that's on NJ Education Aid. He wrote that um, we were the biggest loser as of 2016. Um, remember that the, the total spending per pupil in Cherry Hill 2021-2022 was $24,972. Um, I, I, but, okay, we're talking about funds for preschool expansion, and uh, they don't pay for students with disabilities. Uh, I think that's totally wrong. I do, but however, the state wants an accounting to make sure that this doesn't happen because they're so against the kids with disabilities. God forbid any of the money goes to those kids. Um, so the state um, demands an accounting. So why don't you give us accounting? Find out. Well, we, what I want to know is I know last year they gave us 3.4, and this year we're getting 6.1, 6, 6. and that's for 540 students. Well, give us a full accounting. How much money totally Will we be really spending? And, and even that, if, if some, uh, the total accounting, just like this is a total accounting, the total accounting of how much money that is. Uh, that's what I'd like to know. Um, we're getting 3.4 million. Next year, we're getting 6.1. We have 540 students, 540 students. Um, just so you know, Voorhees is getting, uh, has about, is getting about 6.4. They don't have anything close to 500, to 540 students. In fact, they're only responsible totally for about for about um, 500 students. So right at this point, they don't have 540. They obviously are getting more money per pupil than we are. How great school districts, um, as far as I know from their from their plan, they have they're getting 500 students this year. Uh, at the most 700, but I read 500. That was that was what they that's what they they they, they went for. They're getting 13.7 million in preschool expansion. So um, a lot of people are getting more money than we are. And I, maybe you could think about dialing back the preschool expansion from 540 to maybe 400. Uh, that may not be such a bad idea. That may save us some more some money. And probably is a good i is a is a is a good idea. By the way, kids with dis uh, kids with disabilities should get paid. And again, it definitely should matter. Thank you. It shouldn't and be we a move on. Your time is up. Thank you. We move on to the next person. If anyone would like to speak, please approach the podium. And I'm here in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. So I am very con confused when you're speaking about the budget earlier. I got it up to three million dollars in actual dollars for the pre-K expansion. What I did not hear, what I would really like to know in the current proposed budget that you voted on, okay, how many dollars, district dollars, in district dollars, not the grants, not last year's funding source, whatever you're calling it these days, how much is devoted to pre-K expansion in the 24-25 budget? A dollar amount. Because I think that when you're talking about a $7 million loss, People try to warn the succeeding the, the board before this about the expansion, regardless of the dollars. I, I wouldn't count on the next governor giving you so much money for any more for pre-K. But as a citizen who pays taxes in this town, as we all do, I would like to know a dollar amount that you're submitting to the county commissioner tonight. Secondly, Mrs. Tong, I don't understand. Um, how you can abstain on the position of superintendent of our schools um, without at least giving an explanation. Um, you, you certainly worked with him for a while. I'm, I can't believe it would be a conflict of interest, but quite frankly, I'm insulted. So that means you either didn't attend these interview sessions for the superintendent, or I have to make the assumption, and I'll, I'll just say that I as a person will make that assumption but if that's the case, then that's not fair to us or the students in this district, nor to any qualified candidate that would be our superintendent, regardless who it may be. So I I'm sorry. I mean, it's not just it's just not professional. I would like to hear a dollar amount tonight, and I think the public deserves it. Because if you're talking about cutting programs for our other kids and staff members, which quite frankly could get really high, okay, we're in trouble. Thank you. Okay, we go to the line and um, Laura Pendergast. Hi, 
Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I'm sorry. We just have to restart the clock. Could you hold on a second? Oh, go ahead now. Thanks. Sure. Um, I had meant to call during first public comment, but I was transporting kids places. Didn't work out. Um, so I'm Laura Pendergast, Cherry Hill, and I just wanted to call to congratulate the board for making a great choice um, and also using a equitable process. I think it was the right choice to do a national search. Um, and it seems clear to me that that national search has been successful and has yielded an excellent candidate. Um, and congratulations to Dr. Morton. Um, so thank you so much to everybody who was involved in that process. I really appreciate the seriousness with which the board took the process. Thanks so much. Okay, we go back to the room. Hi. Jennifer Nadio, Cherry Hill resident. I'm sorry, just Jen, Mrs. Nadio, hold oh, on one second. The clock, the clock. Again. Sorry, Mrs. Sugars is a I should have, very I should busy have right now. Sorry. She's been very busy lately. And she's got a lot to do in the meeting. Thank you. Go okay. ahead. Sorry. Jennifer Nadio, Cherry Hill resident. I'm speaking on behalf of my family and all my fellow families who have been affected by cuts for years. I've been asked in the past not to make this statement. However, many of us have been fighting for our students for over 15 years, and we will now continue to fight now that we've lost more funding. When we lost funding during Governor Christie's government cuts, special education was cut first. Students lost their one-to-ones, speech, PT and OT, et cetera. Case managers at the preschool told my family that we couldn't have these services because they didn't want the district to see they spent money. After I started bringing my recorder to the meetings, they stopped saying that. One of our twin sons needed an augmentative speaking device as he was physically aggressive to communicate. Our speech teacher stated, he has words, he can use them. He couldn't tell us his needs and wants or what bothered him hungry, thirsty, bathroom, headache, et cetera. Communication devices only work when a school and a family teach it together. They didn't want to pay for it because they didn't have the funds. My son is still non-communicative. He was restrained so much throughout the years that he's receiving home instruction due to his PTSD. Students with disabilities didn't learn to read. Many of these stu students need to go out of district to obtain their needs. Many families whose children are getting close to aging out or aged out years ago were affected and they're coming to you every week. Dr. Potowitz, you need to listen to Dr. Potowitz. You're blowing them off. Please listen to the history of these families. None of you were active in that fight for the budget because I would have seen you there. We were told that we needed to fight, so my husband and I have been advocating for 18 years, and we've not been alone. Please listen to our families. Many families whose children started school in 2006 and going forward have been paying for their own services. Families started getting tutors to get help because the district couldn't meet their need. It's the job of a school district to educate all children so they can be productive members of the community. It wasn't until the buildings started to decay that the district started fighting for the money. But many of our children in special education lost services and the opportunity to receive a quality education. Please think before you deduct. Thank you so much. Okay. You go back on the line. I believe it's a hand that was already had spoken uh the number so we have each person has an opportunity to speak once during each public comment period the phone number is 891 have you already had it okay the hand is down now so that might be the case maybe i was right um this is back to the room we have no more hands online we go back to the room if anyone would like to speak i would just hold on we'll get the oh, there we go laurie neary cherry hill i can't believe i'm i'm devastated to be standing here speaking about budget cuts and funding cuts after the fight that we took to the state budget committee, Senate committee, at that time, Commissioner Repolette's office screaming about the funding. It, it's, it's beyond devastating to me to be speaking here on this again. I'm terrified, I'm, I'm beyond angry. I'm absolutely terrified at what I saw tonight in the budget proposal. I'm upset about preschool because the governor had the audacity to come here 
and put on a display for us to put the money out up front to get it later, which means we are taking from students that are here now to stand here to then hand us that aid package with a $7 million cut and then say, find it. After 10 to 15 years, we begged for the money while our buildings crumbled, our students suffered, the programming suffered, and I can't agree with you more, Mr. Root, and everything you said, because it's not wealth, trust me, because somebody's got magical home value that if the market dissipated tomorrow, it's gone. So I am so concerned to see this. I don't wanna see staffing cuts. I don't wanna see programming cuts, but I tell you an extremely urgent cautionary tale. You will not be able to tax your way out of this. In fact, it is a very dangerous proposition to tax your way out of this. I will give you one word, Swedesboro. That is a community that was doing quite well. They were building homes, their taxes were low, and they tried to make up for their budgetary deficits when that funding formula came forward and they were not appropriately funded for the influx of students and they foreclosed. We are one of 10 counties called out that may face serious foreclosure rates. I caution you, bank cap looks easy. This is a funding spiral. You wanna look for other cuts? We have a police department that no other school district has. What is the liability coverage to have armed officers in buildings? That should be outsourced to the appropriate parties that do it, our police department of Cherry Hill. There are significant costs associated with that. I task you to take a look at it. We need to start making hard decisions. This is not a one-year problem, Mr. Sugars is right. I've looked at it. This is a many-year problem. So I caution you, don't look to tax your way out of it if you don't want to look like Swedesboro. Thank you. Okay, we go back to the lines. And no hands are up online, so we go back to, oh, I take it back. There's a hand. Christina, if you could please say your full name and your municipality, please. And as soon as the timer goes up on the screen, you can get started. There we go. Hi, Christina Musso, Cherry Hill. Um, I just wanted to second and third the comments that have been made about the budget for proposed budget and the um, issues that we're facing because of the state cuts in funding. I was one of the folks that was 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 concerned about proposing preschool expansion and last year when we were discussing it and it, uh, the comments I kept hearing publicly were, well, we're going to get stated, we're going to get stated, they're going to fund us. And I just, I don't, I think I'm, I'm flabbergasted and, and baffled myself. Um, and I just think it's something that we need to, again, to second Mrs. Neary that she's just speaking, she's, I can't say it any better than what she said. And eloquently, I do budgeting for a living and we need to, this is going to be a multi-year faceted issue that we need to take the long-term view on and we need to realize and we need to cut our losses earlier rather than later and dig ourselves into a deeper hole. So thank you. Okay, we go back to the room. Let me just wait for the timer to restart. Okay. Sure. Corinna Morstra in Cherry Hill. Um, I just want to echo again, Cherry Hill African American Civic Association. Uh, the our message board is just once again say congratulations to Dr. Morton. Um, thank you all for passing those votes. Um, just a sidebar, um, not on behalf of Cherry Hill Shaka, just a, on behalf of my family, the Elmore family and the Stratton family. Congratulations! We're very excited to see what you do and to see. Um, if you stick up to all the things that you have said that you want to see happen in the district. Um, and then just for uh, my ex-board mates and for the current board that's sitting, it's, it was a little bit disheartening sitting over there in the corner and hearing some of you like publicly kind of like come against your own board mates. You guys are a team and you're not only a team with just the, those of you that are sitting on this dais, but you're a team with those folks over there. And when you sow dis dissension amongst each other publicly, and when you use this platform to do so, it also feeds out into the cyber universe and the people that are listening in the community and they jump right on it. And so I, I encourage you all to find some way, whether it needs to be a retreat or it needs to be an open conversation, or as we call it at my nonprofit, a come to Jesus meeting, because that is 
like super rude for you guys, it's disrespectful to you, it's disrespectful to us as a community to see that you guys have so much dissension and that you guys are like borderline breaking your own oaths by talking about conversations that happen behind us. So I just wanted to say that to you all because you're, you're all professionals, you guys are better than that. And I know that you are up at night working hard on these things. And there's other ways to have those conversations besides doing those in public. Um, so that was just one thing. Uh, the other thing is, you know, it, history over time has shown that leaders, once they're placed in, they're always inheriting all of the things of all the other leaders. And the achievement gap, that's not new. The, the things that need to happen with all of the disparities we have from east to west, that's not new. All of the things that you want that everybody is saying, oh, Kwame's not prepared to take on, they're not new. And guess what? He also didn't create them. And neither did the folks sitting over there create them. Those are the things that have been happening for the last 10, 20, 30 years. So I challenge you to actually offer them the supports and help that they need, whether that be through resources through the budget or whether that just be resources through relationships and outside help but give them what they need and do not hold them to all the past people, leaders that they did make mistakes, but give them what they need so that they can be the future and do what you want them to get done. So it's good to see you all. Have a good night. Good night. Uh, no other hands online. So we go back to the room. Uh, Rick Sure, Cherry Hill. Uh, I'm just gonna kind of piggyback off that. I, I don't agree with a past board member. I think you aren't fighting between each other about uh, fair funding. Um, I think the one thing that we can all agree on in this room is that we want to see the best for the Abbott districts. Um, you remember most of the money is going to the Abbott districts. The thing that I hope would uh, rail up Dr. Rood and everybody else in the room is that we're giving them $100 million, but their academics isn't getting better. So I think we can all agree in this room that we want to see the best for uh, Newark, we want to see the best for Camden, we want to see the best for all these kids, but these Abbott districts that get millions and millions of dollars, they're not held accountable and their, their academics isn't rising. All right, now, now on to my uh, comment about the appointment of uh, our soon-to-be superintendent. Um, there was a comment made about uh, one of our uh, board members abstaining. Well, if you know the history of the uh, Cherry Hill Public Schools, you would know that Mrs. Tong also abstained from the African-American vote. And she might have abstained for that. I, I can't tell her what to do, but you know, for quite a long time, I've been saying this whole African-American thing is just one big ideological scam. scam. So back when I was talking about uh, Dr. Kinde, who just perpetuates racism, um, everybody else was still going for, 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 full bore ahead. So I come to you as, uh, as our new super, almost superintendent, and I ask the same question. Um, the question is, Dr. Morton, um, can you name 10 schools in the United States that DEI has improved? Because I myself believe that DEI um, separates and creates more racism. Um, now on to um, some of the bond issues. Um, you know, security is supposed to be the number one concern. So the question is, is why are we not taking the $300 million and hardening our elementary schools. Now you've already gotten an email from uh, 12, of, uh, 12 or 15 parents asking to do this. You have the money, but you're not hardening it. Why aren't you doing anything with this budget with bus safety after a student almost dies? I mean, does a student have to die before you get serious? I mean, it is just crazy. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little riled up because I don't wanna see another injury, you know, like, Okay. Next question uh, towards uh, Dr. Rude. Dr. Rude, why are we not uh, doing the outside windows of uh, Cherry Hill West? We have $300 million. We both can agree that we want uh, better green. Why are we wasting so much energy at West? Why aren't you asking these questions? Uh, now, uh, get on, getting on to, to the Stockton project. Uh, Stockton project is a disaster. It has potholes. It's, uh, it's missing curves that was supposed to be replaced. It's missing bullards that was supposed to be installed. I have five seconds and it's missing a fence around the thing. What is going on? Okay, we go back on the line and there are no hands online. So we go back to the room. Just, yep. I mean, Doran, uh, Cherry Hill, um, 
just a couple little things. Um, one, I, I I do agree that um, if someone's going to abstain, they should give a reason. You know, conflict of interest. I heard for some things, but definitely, if you're going to abstain, to give us to give us a little bit of an idea. Um, I, I it, it is disturbing to me to hear that certain board members may have been, uh, I don't know if it was directed, asked, recommended, whatever, not to speak about their vote. Um, my feeling is every one of you is valuable. Every one of you brings unique skills. Some, you know, sometimes agree agree with you, sometimes I don't agree with you, but, but I value all of you. And I think um, that it's either everybody can share or nobody can share. I don't think that it should just be the people that are voting the way of the majority to, that gets to share. I think everybody should get to share their vote or nobody shares why they voted. Um, so I don't know what the ethics are behind that, but just in terms of integrity, you know, and also giving, we, we talk a lot in this district about it, the, the importance of everybody's voice. And we got, we got to do that right from the top. So everybody's voice matters. And I want to hear all your voices. Ending on some positives. Um, I thought, you know, hearing about what Garrison is doing, working with our students, uh, that, that's exciting to me. And I hope in this, this bond preparation, I know we've, we've looked at like the continuing, um, I forget, always forget what they're called, but the technical education opportunities and things, maybe there's some ways to also show some of our students a little bit of the work that electricians are doing or HVAC is doing. I know we have to consider safety and liability, but you know, anywhere we can to show them little pieces, the plumbing, you know, all the different things to show them some of these other careers possibilities and how it really looks. So I think that's just so exciting. And maybe that this thing with the architects could just be step one. And I had the pleasure of being at the strategic planning meeting and hearing the staff and full presentation about the, um, the gardens, um, the pollination gardens. It sounds like such an exciting project and I can't wait. I hope we get the grant. And I know Ms. Stefan is committed to doing some of it. If we can't, if we don't, even if we don't get the grant to doing some of it, but I just think it's so exciting. And um, I hope you all get to hear more about it and I hope we get that grant. So thank you for letting me speak. Okay, we go back on the line. There's no hands on the line. We go back to the room. Uh, Yoni Irish, Cherry Hill. Just want to give a shout out to Ms. Winter. Thank you for sharing Eastside as a proud Eastside alum. For this week, I also sat in on a journalism advisor meeting where I'll be coming at my new school. Um, very cool to get to do that with Gags, um, who was my advisor at East. Um, Eastside is a gift that keeps on giving. Um, our student journalism here plays dividends. Everyone talks about that. We have writing that you get from your English classes, but the writing you get from journalism takes it that much further. Um, and our support of having that at both comprehensive high schools is huge. Um, middle school schedule change looks great. I am just deeply concerned about the world language sections, especially when you've got the LC houses or teams, depending on which middle school you're at, having the two LC, those two groups together. I know some classes at Rosa are very high in over 30, and we are desperate for foreign language teachers and world language teachers. Could we explore adding different languages in based on who we have in our community. Um, we've got a growing uh, Jewish population, a, Jew, a growing population of Irish speakers who potentially bring that in and get them to go through the alternative route rather than looking at, I hate to say old school, but French and Spanish are old school um, in terms of the approach of things that maybe we need to look at evolution. We are a forward thinking district. Um, so look at more options that play into what we have in terms of who's available. Um, I would like to use some of the bank capped I don't know, I agree, I don't wanna use all of it and tax our people into oblivion, trying to cover for what Trenton did and not make it our taxpayers problem. But I think using some of it is fiscally responsible. Um, can we do more shared services with the township, especially if we're looking at building grounds to see what they can take over because the township seems like they're cash slushed and they've got less restrictions in terms of how they can fund themselves compared to what we are. The uh, state really likes hamstringing school districts with limitations, whereas townships are given much more free reign. Um, I assume at some point we're going to have to talk about increasing the participation fee at the um, secondary level, uh, which has been held at a cap. I just think it needs to be had during this discussion now while we're talking about budget challenges. Uh, giant shout out, the unified front between CHEA, CHASA, each, um, the district, fair funding has been incredible. It has never happened this way before. And it says a lot about what our district has done over the last couple of years that we launched a full fledged campaign in three days. Um, and have been, it's great. And we're getting new names and new people coming up who haven't been out there, which is even huge because now we can bring these people in after this to be more engaged in the process. So yes, this totally stinks, but there is a silver lining in that we're getting more people engaged and more people are engaged, better things happen. Um, I thank you to all of you. You guys put in overtime beyond overtime over the last six months during the search. 
your family has made sacrifices beyond sacrifices. I thank them. I hope the community thanks them and thanks you for everything you did. This wasn't what many of you signed up to do when you ran. No one knew that we we're going to be doing this process and that you were going to be spending your Saturdays at the Lewis building, but you were. And just thank you so much. Um, your results pay dividends. And I just want to say how much we appreciate that. Um, and I think I covered it for now. Thanks. Okay, we go back to the line. There are no hands online. So I go back to the room if anyone else would like to speak. Not, not a whole lot of people left at 10, 15 at night, 10, 14, but okay. I'm gonna close public comment and I'm going to um, just make a quick clarifying comment that tonight's budget discussion was a presentation and a discussion. Um, and just for the community to understand that discussion continues and on the 19th will be our public budget presentation meeting and um, vote on at that point in time, the initial budget submission. Um, so people can feel free to come out then and uh, uh, we'll have more information by that point. Okay, I'll turn it over to Dr. Morton for acting superintendent comments. Thank you, for, thank you very much, Ms. Stern. I will not be long tonight. Uh, it is very late, uh, but I definitely want to say thank you to everyone who uh, gave uh, public comment uh, this, this, this evening. Um, thank you for your perspectives. The beauty in the democratic process is that we have an opportunity to share our opinions, to share our thoughts, and you have a right to, a right to do so. And I respect you know, what everyone has to say, and I think you know, everyone else has to have respect for everyone's uh, opinions. Uh, thank you to the board for its diligence and this entire process. I know it was a tremendous amount of work for you. Um, just as you know, the last public comment said, uh, very lengthy and long process and you put sincere uh, and passionate effort into it. Um, on behalf of those who love this district and love Cherry Hill, thank you for the approach that you, that, that you took. Um, whether I was the candidate or not, I'd say thank you for the approach that you took and the effort that you, you put into ensuring that our, our children have the best uh, leader for moving forward. Um, you know, it's important. As, as I've visited schools this, this past week and since the announcement, uh, our kids have continued to show up with the same vigor, passion, and excitement uh, that they've always had. Uh, they're none the wiser, to be quite honest with you, about budget cuts and deficits and, and things along those lines. And they're looking to us for a great experience. It's our job as the adults to insulate our kids and give them the experience that they deserve. Um, this time calls for, it, it's for tremendous focus. This is not a time for us to, to be picked off by focusing on internal things, uh, internal things that may be happening within the district um, as it relates to funding. It calls for focus and focusing our efforts and our attentions on where they need to be directed. The bottom line is that we have been underfunded for many, many, many years. The bottom line is that our underfunding has required it's required this, 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 these uh, taxpayer, taxpayers in town to adopt the largest, most historic bond referendum in the history of New Jersey to ensure that our, our buildings and our facilities are suitable for our kids, that they reflect 21st century needs, and that they reflect just basic things such as roofs and, elect and, and um, HVAC systems and things along those lines. We have been underfunded for far too long. Yet again, as Ms. Neri said, we're back in the same situation. Please join us as we, be, as we begin to make our voices heard. Join us as we begin to go to our legislators and tell them about our displeasure with what's happened and we demand action to take place. Um, we've been circling a wagon. We, we know, we're, we're meeting with uh, our township. Thursday, I'm gonna be uh, presenting in front of the Senate Education Committee. Um, the week after on the 20th, we have a group of unified folks going forward to present to the assembly. You know, we, we need those type of momentums and, and that type of effort and moving forward. Let's direct our focus where it needs to be. We need our fair share of funding. That's what we're asking for. That's what de we're demanding and moving forward. Uh, the general fund contribution to, to preschool for next year is $1.5 million. Please keep in mind that we've, we've, we've had a preschool program for a very long time. Um, there was a general fund contribution for the preschool program. Our program itself has moved from half day to full day as we've expanded, but, but there's been a contribution that's, that's been required over the years. I uh, can't tell you the exact number right now, but, but there has been uh, one for, for many, many times. Um, 
It's the month of March. We're moving quickly into spring. Positive weather coming out. Our kids continue to do great things. Uh, let's be optimistic, positive, and let's work together and moving forward to get you know what, what we need and what we demand, and that's fair funding. Thank you, Dr. Morton. Okay. Make a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Dr. Rude, all in favor? Aye, motion carries, meeting is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>